Eric July, welcome to Dad Saves America. Appreciate you having me, big time. All right, we got lots to talk about. Yep. So first of all, I'll, let me set the stage. So you are a musician. You are a you are a Marvel. You are soon to be Marvel mutilating <laughs> media mogul in the making. <laughs> uh, I'll you're, take it. You're a political social commentator and um, and a creative entrepreneur at the end of the day. You are an entrepreneur. You are creating new things for people and try to meet a customer. Yeah. So let's just start with why, as someone who cares about ideas, like mm -hmm. why does culture and why do comic books in particular mm -hmm. matter? Like why put that energy, that passion into comic books? Well, I mean, I do feel like Comics in particular, especially in in the West, are, are more direct in, in America. I mean, you think of characters like a Superman, a Batman. These characters like transcend like comics. You actually look at them maybe like a part of American culture, like a part of the fabric of American culture, right? So they've always been sort of uh, this important thing. And even now, I mean, granted, it's kind of trending in a way that people are, like the youngsters, trending more to like some of the Japanese stuff with like manga, but it's a comic at the end of the day, right? Yeah. Um, and it's very, very, very influential. So for me, it was like looking at me being a lot life, comic book lifer, seeing some of the problems that plague the industry, both uh, creatively and economically, and I saw it as an opportunity. Right. Um, I, it, it wasn't my first rodeo doing like creative stuff, as you mentioned, like me be, uh, being in a band and, and multiple bands and doing that. So I wasn't going into it like completely blind. Yeah. But of course, I would have never thought that this was going to make three point seven million dollars. Like that wasn't Amazing. Th that wasn't <laughs> that, I, I, I want to be clear. That was not on. A, I didn't even think that was a possible thing. But it goes to show just how this resonated with so many people. And again, I just wanted to, to, I put a lot of money into it, a lot of effort into it. And again, it was about trying to be part of the solution because I think it definitely in a commentary space, uh, too often we get tied up into tr always talking about problems, right? It's yeah. like, hey, here's an issue, here's an issue, there's a problem, there's, a, there's something that needs, to, needs some sort of resolution, but we don't actually come up with it, right? So for me, I wanted to make sure that, okay, now that I have especially the financial capacity to do this, all right, it's one thing for me to be griping on YouTube all day long. It's another for me to put my money where my mouth is and actually be a part of the part of the solution. So that was what kind of conceptualized the Ripperverse and everything that I'm doing kind of with, with, with comic books because I am a solution-oriented solution, solution -oriented man. And I do believe that God did put me on this earth to create. And I say that all the time because, you know, you look at my bands and yeah. all that. Like anytime I'm in a creative spot, we have seen the most success. I've individually seen the most success. So I think that's what I'm put on this world to do, especially when it comes to influence, influence and culture. It's about like doing stuff in, in the arts and, and being out there creating. You are so right. I, I mean, I, I'm not as big of a comic book guy as my best friend Josh. When we moved down here to Austin, he had like 15 long boxes nice, with him. Nice, <laughs> nice. But I love graphic novels. And when I was a kid, I actually wanted to be a Disney animator. So okay. I, I would do comic books of like Disney characters. Like, go, it's, it's 90s. It was yeah, like yeah, the yeah. Disneys go to Baghdad and go to war and all yeah. kinds of weird stuff. Yeah. Like a weird little young Republican Disney wannabe. Yeah. But I think that that notion that this is our mythology now. Like these are the archetypal stories that sort of define what it means to be a hero. Like, what does that mean for you to be a hero? Because that's oh. that's such a central. I mean, like your character, central character, is like a reluctant return to to, to, to heroism, right? right? Right. So, what's that mean? Yeah, I mean, I look at heroism, and I mean, you 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 talk about that being so so much a part of like again like American culture, and you know what people deem as like the hero's journey. And it's what makes these characters sort of relatable, right, to each and every individual. It doesn't matter kind of what background and, and all that stuff. It's because you get to see these people, even if they're powerful. Like, you take Isom, who can do all these these cool things because he's strong, right? Uh, obviously, I can't do any of that stuff. But, <laughs> you know, there's some there's an ability to resonate, especially, especially when you talk about that trait where it, it's some reluctancy, right? You know, everybody yeah. probably has experienced that in some capacity, right? Where there is something that they need to do or, you know, you talk about with, like, Isom, too, and, and what made... I saw him retire in the first place and uh, how that kind of almost traumatized him to the point to where he was like, I want to put the suit up. And now we're dealing with this journey, right, of him 
trying to get back into that in into that sort of position. And I think that's why these stories matter so much and why the appeal is so great and has been historically, again, from different, you can find people of completely different opposite backgrounds that will be a fan of a character like Superman or a, char a character like a Batman or Spider-Man, especially Spider-Man. Uh, uh, for that matter, when you talk about that journey, people talk about Peter Parker getting beat up all the time, <laughs> right? That's what we had, to, yeah. we had to experience that. We had to see that all the time. But I think that has a lot to do with the growth because, you know, it's kind of uh, uh, reminding people that there is kind of light at the end of the tunnel. There is an, a, another side uh, uh, to to get to and you, you do what you need to do to, to sort of keep going. And people love to see that. And I think that's why, you know, we've seen this in in uh, in recent like comic books that, that have been produced where you get these like perfect characters and they yeah, don't the resonate. Sort of the Mary Sue's. The Mary Sue's, right? They right. don't resonate with any, anybody, female or male. It, it doesn't resonate with anybody, and that's because that hero's journey just simply is not there. It is such a core part to to storytelling in general, but especially with American comic books. I think um I think about that as one of the things that made Marvel so powerful relative to and the struggle with DC because mm -hmm. it was like you've got Superman who's like can do a, everything, a god on yeah. earth. So you've got to invent. <laughs> Oh, let's come up with, we got to find some way for him to not just always be winning. Um, but Peter Parker being that, I think he's he's like one of the earliest of Stan Lee's creations, right? Yeah, it was in the 60s. Uh, uh, yeah, so it was yeah, 63, though, was that? Yeah, so that would have been one of the first uh, first bits. One of the first ones, I think, like that people caught on with was Fantastic Four. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously, the you can make the argument the most prominent Marvel character, right, uh, would be Spider-Man, I think, if, uh, you know, really think about it. And then you talk about the most prominent character uh, in comic books. But, yeah, it's Marvel's approach was like, hey, it's the world outside kind of kind of situation, which made yeah. it, I think, it especially relatable, right, um, in, in comparison to DC. Not to say that DC was not ever relatable or, or anything like this, but you had a lot of reluctancy. You want to talk about that with some of these heroes who were godlike, right? Um, where you also had on the other side with Marvel, it was more so people like kind of aspiring to be kind of uh, the, these great things. So it, again, I, I, that, that core tenet of, of just storytelling and, and the hero's journey is just so so very vital um, to this to this part of the industry. And you know, when I was coming up with ISOM. And I was coming up even with like the Alpha Core members. I wanted to make sure I didn't make that mistake. I didn't want people to look at these characters and feel like they can do everything and uh, there is zero struggle because nobody can relate to that. It's not going to have any sort of staying power then. But, you know, you read Isom 1, you want to read Isom 2 because, you know, at the end of it, he's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put this suit back on. Now you're like, okay, what, yeah. what's next? Yeah. Why did he hang it up in the first it's, place? It's the right? classic reveal at the end of the first Yeah, part. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. He, oh, he's, to do that. he's been in like a red hoodie and now the suit's on. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. like, okay, now we're getting down to business. Exactly, exactly. Or, growing up, Marvel or DC, which, where, where, what was your, who, I'm gonna, who were your favorite characters? All right, so I will tell you this. I never had really a one or the other in terms of like, those two companies, but both of my favorite characters were part of uh, DC. Uh, starting with Flash. While it was my Flash uh, growing up, it's funny having Mike Barron here who was writing the first uh, series by Wally West. It's crazy how things have come full circle now that I got guys here they are like, I grew up on your books, man. But it's kind of <laughs> crazy to think about. But Flash was my favorite character, namely because I was an athlete, right? Um, did it all the way through the collegiate level and being a sprinter. So, you know, when you're young, I think you often gravitate towards, hey, who is this character that has this cool power, power that I really like? Yeah. Now, as I aged, you know, you start to get really more into, like, some of the stories and stuff. That's when Batman sort of became yeah. uh, my my favorite favorite character. I think you see that trend like that with a lot of people where, um, especially in, in, in comic books, where when we're young, it's Flash, right? It's like like literal flashes and who can do the coolest thing. And you're like, oh, I really like this character. But, you know, uh, even if you go and reread some of that stuff that you read as a youngster, having the experience, it's a different experience, right? Uh, uh, so digesting that information. And again, that's why I think Batman, just story, just kind of resonated with me a lot more uh, as an adult. The um, And the Dark Knight sort of modernization of Batman in particular was just... I mean that's I guess what, in a way what we grew up with not the not the whiz bang. I remember watching the, yeah. the you know the the smash and crash yeah on Nick at Night but yeah. um who's the who's the who's the, is it Steve Miller am I mis, am I misremembering that the creator of the 
the new Batmans. Um, um oh yeah. It's a guy that used to we used to encounter in the bars in New York City because he'd be like there drunk. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, but you know, Batman again. Full circle, Chuck Dixon being a big part of uh, the Detective Comics in the 90s. Him and Graham Nolan, obviously the creator of Bane and having those guys here at the, uh, or Chuck here at the Riververse has been something crazy. But I also look at that pocket of 90s. And yeah, there may have been some economic turmoil there. People remember, remember in the late 90s, Marvel almost went bankrupt. Uh, that almost happened. Yeah. Uh, and But... I think why that that still that next generation going into the you know especially in the two thousands was able to hold was because there was so much good media that was uh, comic book based. Like you think about the nineties, like people often say that Batman the animated series is like, is like oh. the the definitive Batman, right? I think that's right. Yeah, and it's just one of the best TV yeah, shows yeah. ever. I, I would make that argument as well. The definitive Batman. But you also had during that era like X Men the animated series, right? That was coming out during that same mm -hmm. block of time when I was growing up. You had Spider Man, obviously, and then uh, they even were doing some weird stuff with like uh, Silver Surfer and all and all that. But it was just such a good time to be into into comics because pretty much whatever way that you looked, uh, th there was an adaptation. There. It's funny because it was like in the movies we had this kind of early, almost like false start. Mm -hmm. We had the X Men movies, which started off good and then started to like trail off, and yep. then we had the, you know, the Sam Raimi Spider Man movies, which again were good and then started to get progressively not so good, mm -hmm. and then you went through the lull before Iron Man kind yep, of comes. Yep, yep, it was a, it was a, it was a true lull, um, and then that got people back into it. Unfortunately, we didn't see a big boom in like the sales. I have my own opinions on on why that happened, despite you know that Marvel Cinematic Universe getting as big as it did. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't seem like they were able to translate a lot of that stuff into like new comic book readers or buyers or, or, or what have you, as massive as it might have been. That was uh, it's kind of a crazy phenomenon. I don't think we've ever seen that kind of anywhere where it's something that no. massive. And it's like the books almost would just, there was no increase. There was no increase in sales with these characters in their books. I don't, I don't think we've ever seen anything like that. So what... So you've obviously, you've been vocal about trying to do things differently. Mm -hmm. so, so both, and you said both economically, but culturally. So what's gone wrong? Now, I mean, it's 2024. There's tons of people talking constantly about this. Nerdrotic and oh, the yeah. critical drinkers, just as far as YouTubers. Yeah, no. The MCU, yes, there's all the kinds MCU. of fun. I watch all these, all these mostly guys. Yeah. It's all great stuff, yourself included. Yeah. But how do you think about it? Like, what's your story about what's gone wrong that you're trying to fix? I know that, you know, some people paint me as, you know, they put me in that light of, hey, it's just woke stuff, yada, yada, yada. And people that have listened to me over the years know that my complaints extend well beyond that. Is that part of it? Yeah, you'd be a fool not to concede at least that, especially going at, like, with all new, all different Marvel, which was in the twenty mid-2010s. Um, and that's when a lot of this stuff seemed to pop off and then a certain thing happened in 2016 and everybody just <laughs> lost their minds, unfortunately. In <laughs> a certain comic book like character yeah, entered yeah. the scene. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And it just everybody <laughs> lost their minds. Is he a mind. super villain or a superhero? <laughs> yeah, depending on what way that you <laughs> look at him. And everybody lost their minds then and it started to bleed into the content. But I look at yeah. the, the creative stuff and, you know, I had even simple issues and people that have read our code of ethics know where I'm going with this. Timeline problems. Like the fact that if you are, let's say you did watch a movie and it was like, oh, I, I, like, I like Batman, right? I saw this movie, recent movie, Dark Knight, whatever, and I, 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 I like the character. I want to get into the comic books. And then I have to use basically a, a whiteboard that I have to go across this entire room to try to explain to you where you, you should start. Because there's like six number ones, right? You can't just start at number one because there's right. a number one in Rebirth in 2016. It was a number one, Batman number one in 2011. There were no new 52. And then before that, but Batman also, his series is different from Detective Comics, which is his own series. And uh, then there's this other Batman running around. See, I have to do all of this yeah. stuff. And it's impossible for something to keep. So Even you, before Multiverse went full crazy. Yeah, it went crazy with DC. I'd make the argument that DC was on to something in the 80s when Christ on Infinite Earths happened, when they were trying to fix that problem. The timeline issue is like, hey, we got all of these different versions of this di these different characters. How about we just collapse the universe in into one and now they're all, all, all these multiverses into one and now you know, there's just one version of the character running around. 
And then they went back on that, unfortunately. But no, that was some of the problems it is that I that I saw with in terms of creatively with these uh, with these issues in sort of comic books. It just doesn't make for a very entertaining experience, especially when you don't have anywhere to go with it. So you have that bit of it, but the culture part, I think our approach is different because you know you read Isom. Yep. It's not like anarcho capitalism the book, right? That's not my. <laughs> that's not what there I'm, is <laughs> there is one little hint. That I'll bring up of your political philosophy. It's not a political book. I read it. I, 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 yeah. I hadn't read it until until prepping for for you to come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me find it. Let me find it. Yeah, Let's yeah. Where, where, where is it at? There's a great picture of you. It's like a little breather moment with a little taxation is theft. Oh yes, yes. Yeah, that's, that's toward the end. That's toward the it end. It's toward the end. Okay. Let me throw it in with my hat. My hat on. Yeah, sure. I remember it's, that. It's great. It's a great. It's a great. Uh, here we go. There we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll put this up for the camera. With my hat. Can we get yeah, yeah. that? Get that on my camera. Get that close up. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's subtle. Yeah. <laughs> but you get what it is. I'm saying. It's like I'm not gonna let what my politics are like be trying to beat you over the head with the story. Like it has nothing to do with the story or anything with what it is that we're uh, 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 that we're doing. So when I talk about the changes culturally. I will point to something like what happened with, um, uh, for the people that don't know, Carolyn, um, she was a, a community manager for Limited Run Games, right? and uh, she was wrongfully, I'd argue, uh, let go from her job because some freak, I'm going to call it what the person is, who doesn't even work for the company, went to try to dig on some things and found out she was following people that are maybe on a different side of the political spectrum than her. And they let her go because of the hoorah that was made online by this one individual. Oh, I remember this. Right. So... Was what, this part of, was this sort of aftermath of Gamergate, or am I misremembering this? Was no, this part of that? It, it, no, this was something that was relatively recent. This yeah. happened uh, uh, or, re or relatively recent. I mean, you can make the argument it's the, it's it's the same culture that, uh, that came out of Cancel that Cancel culture. Stuff. Yeah, that sort of stuff. That's exactly what it was. So for me, you know, we brought on Carolyn. She, you know, I, I was one of the first people to actually interview her after that whole deal deal happened. And, you know, opening came up and I was like, why don't you come work with work with us? You, you, we already know you can do the job. And, you know, she's having the time of her absolute life working for the Ripperverse. And I look at that type of thing is where, like, the, the cultural sort of impact of something like the Ripperverse uh, uh, existing. Because it allows people to be able to be themselves without fear of having to, well, I might say something online or I might have said something online 10 years ago that someone might get mad at. And, and then try to make a big fuss about it, and then you know that the company's gonna fire me. They don't have to worry about that uh, here at the Riververse. And the reason why I think that's so very important is because you're gonna get the best out of these employees uh, and these contractors, having them known that, right? They know that they can be themselves, and I believe work. I, I mean, I couldn't imagine it working like walking on those eggshells or feeling like you have to walk on those, on those eggshells yeah. just to just to create. Like I can't imagine you putting your best foot forward under those conditions, right? You just did a, a, a Twitter video specifically about this, right? Yeah. About like what what you're about in terms of as a company. Yeah. What was that message? That message was, look, everybody knows that I'm a commentator for sure. But we have our only rule here at the Riververse when it comes to stuff like that, just leave it at the door. And that includes me, right? They would just leave it at the door. Except for the tech. Yeah. <laughs> not not to call you out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get what it is you're saying. But like, again, it's not, it's not the drive. But that's part of you. That's yeah, part right. of you. That's, uh, that's me. Yeah. And again, it's not the it, it it's not the it's not the driving point of the of this company, right? Like or the story. It, or the story, right? Like at, at all. Like that would be a fundamental problem. I'd be a hypocrite if I did that, right? All this stuff that I'm griping about Marvel and DC about beating everybody over the head with the political views and stuff, I'd be a, a hypocrite if I did the same exact thing. So the point is it's not that people are should be amoral. It's not that people shouldn't have principles, a guiding set of ethics or whatever. Uh no, it's that Again, don't let it get in the way of the stories it is that we're telling and don't like disrespect the customers in the process of doing it. That's it. Leave everything else at, at the door. So that's what it is that I was explaining. I mean, because, you know, we have people that are here. We're a growing company. The, go the company's getting bigger and bigger. And, yeah, there's going to be people that may differ. I mean, I don't think there's enough maybe anarcho-capitalists to find, right, uh, no. for, for us no, to hire, not. right? You know <laughs> what I'm saying? So I, I couldn't fill my whole entire company with that. 
But no, it's just people, I don't care where they're at. Those are my only two requirements. The, the way that I worded it in that video is I say, just don't be a hack. That's my only requirement. I don't care where you're at on anything <laughs> else. You can work for the Riververse. I, my only requirement is that you don't be a hack. But I believe- What's a hack? What do you when mean When I say a hack, I mean, again, someone who is so ideologically obsessed that they allow it to get in the way of business. They allow it to get in the way of, of work. And I think that's what we've seen a lot with the main mainstream. Again, going back to what happened in 2016, which sent everybody, made everybody crazy. People taking it to social media to absolutely actually disrespect uh, longtime fans of a lot of different uh, projects and, 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 and brands. And that to me is just totally unacceptable, right? So that's what I mean when I say don't be a hack. Do not allow that stuff to, you can have whatever positions it is that you have have, that's fine. Just don't allow it to get in the way of business. And that's why I word it in a way and I say, just leave it at, at the door. And everybody's done that. It's not a topic of conversation within our within our company or anything other than, okay, how do we make the Riververse better? How do we improve a, a, as a company? How do we improve our stories? How do we improve our, our art? And we have all these big aspirations, Riververse Studios and everything. Everybody's like, we're a goal-oriented company. We're not an ideological uh, obsessed one. And I think that's why it works the way that it is. Because to be honest, a lot of people are just tired of that. And I, I know that, uh, especially with me being a, being a political commentator and being a, a, a libertarian, right? There, there was once upon a time where this type of stuff really didn't even come up with businesses. I think a lot of folks want to return to that. They just want to, if they want to be entertained, they just want to be entertained. They don't really want it to come, come with some... Uh, some other stuff in certain mediums, right? Maybe yeah. it's appropriate in other medium entertainment mediums, but especially like with with comic books. Uh, I've spoke with Chuck Dixon about this many times. He's like, I don't want you thinking about me when you read a Batman story. That's not his point. Like, you, you shouldn't even be thinking about me. You should be thinking about Batman. It's not Chuck Dixon trying to write himself into Batman and his political views into Batman. No, it's Batman is already established. Batman has uh, a persona. We we know who he is. So let that be the primary focus and be the driving point. I think that's just a principle that it works so well for us having that implemented in our company. So you're a super big fan of Black Man, Black Batman, right? Not at all. <laughs> Let's talk about this for a little bit. Let's do bit. it. Let's talk about this, like the, you know, I think now it's it's funny because um, uh, South Park is sort of. Oh yeah, they made They it. planted the flag, yeah. like, you know. <laughs> Put a girl in it, make her gay. Yeah, lame and gay. <laughs> make lame her lame and gay. gay. Yeah. So, how? What's going on there, and yeah. why? You you know, you, you know, wouldn't you have liked there to be a black Batman as a kid? Isn't that legit to be like, hey, here's this character that people love, and I want to make, I want to include more audience, people who aren't seeing themselves in the in this character that's this iconic figure. Yeah, see, for me, I think that is where the insulting of the audience comes in. Because, like I talked about Batman and him being my favorite character, and I, I'm not, well, I can't even use that. I'm not rich anymore. I can't say that anymore. But you get what it is I'm saying. I'm not some rich white guy, you know, walking around, but that's a character that I could relate to, right? And even growing up with, with like, a, a Wally was the same situation. And I think that. A lot of this race stuff is not a lot of it, all of it for the most part, is a superficial kind of thing. And what I mean by that is that it is not like necessarily like the most important thing about me, right? I can I can't control this. I kind of just came out this way. Parents just have to be a certain color, right? I didn't earn it, right? It just kind of just came out the womb yeah. like that. So while I, yeah, I am black, it's not the defining trait of, of me as an as an individual. And I think most people that see themselves as individuals see it sort of of that way. And this hyper emphasis and this hyper focus on trying to get black versions of predominantly or previously white things, it to me is just insane, especially when we're supposed to have this supposed this creativity that floats all around Hollywood and, and, and the comic book industry. But apparently the only thing that they can do is race and gender swap, right? A previous idea that's boring as all get out. And it's funny. Uh, because if we were having this conversation before the Ripperverse, you have a lot of po folks that would run around saying, well, no, the reason why we have to race swap these characters is because, yeah, they throw out the representation nonsense, but they also say that, well, when they try to do original black characters, it doesn't work. Yeah, it does. You do just, yeah. just have to give people what it is that they want. Um, you know, one of our most anticipated characters uh, with our next book, Yaira, woman, female character. 
They will get behind brand new, fresh, original characters just don't suck. That's really what it boils down to, right? I mean, it's simple as it is. Just don't don't suck. But it is a again to me like a insulting thing that they've that definitely recent and modern, I guess, um, creatives. I use that term loosely. Believe that the only way that I can relate to a character is if he shares the same skin tone as me. And I think there's more to me as an individual. I think there's more to uh, other black people that are in the world um, as well. And, uh, you know, people are fans of various different characters. I mean, you look at the anime and the manga scene right now, which is, again, exploded in the West. I don't look like anybody. Go uh, Dragon Ball Z. I'm not like I don't have a tail growing out of my behind, and I can't turn Super Saiyan, and I'm not. You even, can't cause action lines yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, spring just, up just, just by going just like by this. Going like this and, and yelling at the top of my lungs, <gasps> but my hair turns. Yelling. None of that. None. There's no relatability. You can't have weird occasional twitching in your eyes. Yeah, as no, I can't do any of that, right? <laughs> but you know, especially out here, he's arguably the most recognizable character, right? It it, it it just shows, especially by black people, right? There's a huge like anime and manga kind of scene among, among black culture. It don't look like them, and it works out. It's just something that is specifically like these narrow-minded sort of Western creatives, again, using the term creatives uh, very loosely. They just believe that this is the only way that people get behind stuff. And I also think they're just out of ideas no matter how creative they like to think of themselves as they're out of ideas if the only thing that you can do like you know i remember when the dc fandom thing was coming out and that was at 2020 and they were talking about this whole black batman thing it was like is he interesting no talk about this with chuck dixon think about all the uh the the, the sexuality swaps that we've got recently because yeah, now gay, tim Dra- gay superman gay superman you got gay tim drake for some reason even though we just saw him with stephanie brown for 30 years like none of this none of this makes any sort of sense but now they're now they're gay I, I, out of nowhere. Did they make the characters more interesting when they did that? No, they're just gay now, right? There's there's no intrigue there. There's no there's no interest there. They're just now they're just gay, right? So that's what I'm talking about. It's so shallow. It's so boring uh, in terms of their stories that they try to tell, and again, it just never lands. And none of that stuff really really ever works. Do you think we're at the end of that? Do you think that the um the sort of like woke bubble is starting to burst in in the culture space in the movies and I mean obviously like Disney's taking it on the chin Mm -hmm. you know we don't do the same quite the same kind of like bashing on Rachel Zegler and thumbnails 45 (laughs) times a month yeah that but uh not that there's anything wrong with that but um do you think that there's like there's genuinely like an exhaustion with Watching press junkets where the only per- thing that people can talk about is that they're the first this or that, even when it's not true. Yeah, even you, all the time, it's not. <laughs> I'm it's the not, first female yeah, action uh, hero. Yeah, that's what Jennifer Lawrence apparently thought. Yeah, uh, like, uh, okay, Ripley, yeah. but the naughty, like, Princess <laughs> Yeah, like, oh. what are you talking about? But, <laughs> yeah, I do think that, I, I will say this. I think there's two ways to look at it. You got one, and, and, and just from a cultural spec perspective, yes. I do believe that. A lot of people, even the normies, are, are sort of tired, tired of this, right? Um, even though there may have been people gaslighting a lot of people, saying that this wasn't a thing, I think you can't deny it now. It is too... Uh, definitely once South Park covered it, it's like obvious. Like, okay, <laughs> this is a thing. Everybody knows it's a thing. Everybody knows it's a problem, okay? So, yes, I do believe that culturally, people are, even normies, kind of tired of that aspect. On the other, on the flip side, and this is where things get interesting... I still don't believe that the mega corporations that have control of these properties are going to change soon. I don't think they possess the capacity to be able to pivot that quickly anyway, right? I, I mean, and we've seen this. I don't know if you guys uh, heard the chick, I can't remember her name, Charmaine something. She's the um, new director of uh, upcoming Star Wars film. Oh, I've seen a little bit. From her. Leading with activism. Every activism, yep. activism. Yep. And she she even flat out admitted it like this is a part of everything it is that I do. And it's like, okay. Was this fair? Because I think there was some stuff where there's like old, unrelated stuff, interviews from her that was sort of dredged well, up by well, anti-woke no. YouTube and well, said. No, no, no. She flat out said that every, as a filmmaker, everything it is that she does is part, she, she says she's a filmmaker and an activist. I'll take her by a literal, that's what she said. And then she went on about how either overtly or covertly activism is a part of every film it is that she makes, right? That is a disastrous mistake for a Lucasfilm. They have been 
laying egg after egg after egg uh, with, with, uh, with uh, you know, Kathleen Kennedy and her and her approach. Everybody's tired of this. And to me, that shows that they have learned absolutely nothing. They haven't learned anything or they just don't care to pivot. So this is why... Or they want to troll their fans like... Maybe that's what it is. Maybe they get off on this, right? Maybe it is... There's a little bit of like, you know, cynical back and forth. Like, oh, if we... How often do you think we're being punked? Yeah. (laughs) Right? Like like the kind of like, oh, I know like weird right-wing Twitter YouTube is going to get angry and this is going to be tons of free publicity. Yeah, I do think that there is an aspect of it where they do believe that the head... I think it's two things, okay? One, yes. I think they operate like that. Um, where they do believe that making folks feel some kind of way will get headlines. Where they get it wrong is that headlines don't equal sales. This is what the comic book industry has had a very difficult time understanding, especially with the mainstream. Who cares that X, I don't know, uh, comic book uh, uh, publication covered you? Tim Drake, now gay, bold and uh, brave, and Tom Taylor or whatever his name is has a... Or, or, or S on gay S on his chest immediately once he announces it, right? Then you go look at the sales numbers, and nobody has to take my word for anything. Just go look it up, and it falls off an absolute cliff. So all those retweets, all those likes, all those headlines it is that you're getting, what does that ultimately amount to? So while I do think there is some nefarious stuff at play, you know, excuse my language, I think they're also just stupid. Like, I do think there's general <laughs> incompetence that works with mega corporations. Just because I and my familiarity, especially with, like, doing TV stuff and talking to some of these guys, they live in a completely different dimension. And I think that's what differs with some of the creative stuff it is that we do because I can't afford to lose half a billion dollars like they did with um, the Marvels or almost half a billion dollars. If I make something like that that aggravates my, my, my fan base so much to where they're turned off, my company's done. But with the mega corporations, this is why I effectively call them the sugar daddies of the industry because they're the only ones that could sustain these types of losses, right? That's for it. now. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, for yeah. now, maybe, you know, looking at it like a glass to have full kind of situation, <laughs> the properties go into the tank and maybe they come up for sale again. Like I believe, uh, like at one point they got Spider Man Sony for like $7 million. I yeah. could probably afford that, right? So maybe it goes into the tank again. And uh, guys that actually care about the properties are now owners of them. But with the mega corporations, there's both incompetence, and I I think the incompetence comes from the leadership. The nefarious behavior comes from the creatives because I do think they get off on a- aggravating uh, uh, certain pockets of the internet, but more specifically, people that lean a certain way politically. That's not in alignment with them. And again, if they want to keep that up, their business because the, the proof is in the pudding. Half the, half the consumer base is gone. <laughs> it's gone. Like especially di- di- what what's happened with Disney is remarkable. It breaks my heart because I like I um I really did. I I love Disney. Like Walt like Walt Disney is a hero. I wanted to be a Disney animator. My first job out of school wasn't at Disney, but it was at MTV Animation where like Daria and Celebrity nice, Deathmatch were in nice. production and it was like going to Comic-Con at the at the Javits Center, right down the street from our office, like all that stuff. Uh, to see that become so cynical is just like, you're breaking my heart. <laughs> like, I get it. No, I, I get it. I mean, when, definitely when you consider that the even the non, I mean, Disney related pro- properties that they have, you know, I talk about this like with Marvel, me being a comic book guy and, you know, people that are big Star Wars guys or Pixar or all these other companies that they ate up, by the way, that they seem to run into the ground uh, as of recently. And yeah, you feel some kind of way, especially when you grow up on that material, right? Um, it's like, dang, man, you, you don't want to see these characters be ruined. You don't want to see these characters be bastardized. But the way that I see it is I, I was that guy, right? I went a long time. People that follow me on you, I went a long time sitting there griping about my issues until I was like, you know what? They're not going to fix it. And to be fair, I don't know if they have the uh, setup to do it. Like, I do believe that if those individual properties are ever ever going to get back to being kind of prominent, they they have to be owned by someone that cares about it. Not like, you know, 
a mega corporation, like with with a Bob Iger, right? Who doesn't know anything about uh, a Marvel? He doesn't care about any of that, any of that stuff. That's not that's not it's not for him to care. But there's so much disconnect there, and there's no passion, and it shows in the actual product it is that they are producing. They don't have a the, the ownership doesn't have a direct line of sight with the creatives. And again, it shows. It shows people are picking up on this. They can tell when you don't care about it, right? They can tell yeah. when when uh, sometimes they just admit it. Sometimes they'll just flat out, you know, say that they're not interested in it. Or you know, I don't understand how you get people that work these jobs, especially in in leadership positions, be directors that were never fans of this stuff, and they'll be flat out just say, yeah, I, I didn't really even like this stuff. I'm like, what the. Like wh- wh- of all the people to could, select, this is the guy. Couldn't you find one? Couldn't you find somebody that loves? There's a lot of people that love these things. There's a lot, <laughs> a, a, a lot, and a lot of them have that talent to be able to direct and do other things. But you pick the ones that don't care about it. And admittedly, they don't. And again, I think that just a, that's that corporate setup. So for me, I believe that our only way out of this is by is doing what Disney did, and that's creating. I think that's our only way out of it. I think that uh, we're going to have to enter into a new generation of, of, of American media that's going to be original. And I would love for 2024 to be looked at years down the line like there was some sort of creative renaissance that happened there. And there's a lot of new properties that spurred up uh, that are now wildly successful, that are adopted by people of various age groups. It's very, very successful. I would love something like that to happen, but... I, I, I'm going on my days clinging on to Disney and like being like, oh man, I really want you to fix Marvel. Now I'm like, do whatever you want with it. Sorry. <laughs> okay, let's talk business. Yes. So, um, first of all, Ripa, Ripaverse. Now, I understand. What's the origin of that name? Well, that's been my nickname since, I mean, that came from like the rap game. I mean, I got named, that was in middle school when somebody gave me uh, that name. And I was in high school, ironically, when I created my YouTube, which is I was the young group five. It's been the same name uh, since I was, again, a teenager. Uh, but yeah, just stuck. It's just something that, that stuck. And that's been my been my nickname. It was my nickname growing up in, in Dallas. It was my nickname everywhere I went. So you know, it kind of worked out. What was your understanding of how to run a business getting into this game? I love that question. I came up during an era, especially where I here in Texas, right? For people that grew up in the hip hop scene, you know, the mixtape scene in Texas was like the thing where folks were selling mixtapes, CDs out of the trunk of their car. Mixtapes of existing copyrighted uh, music. Uh, uh, no, like, oh. no, I'm talking, oh. I'm ta- well, those were those hustlers, but I'm talking about like the actual artist. Okay. Right, that yeah. was the that was the hustle, especially in Dallas and Houston. Right, that though that that was especially the hustle out there. So I grew up in that era. Right, that was my that was my first introduction to like business per se was being an artist. Right, being a creative, and you know this was before uh, you know a lot of the the, the Spotify's and all all that none of that stuff was around. Oh, no. I, mean, I think MySpace might have been 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 there but it wasn't like a place where a lot of people were going to put their music on uh it's stuff like that it was it was hey burn a cd burn a bunch of cds convince people to buy it performing it at shows and doing stuff like that so my understanding of business came from that scene that scene club scene and 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 all of that and then one thing led to another and again that was a hustle that was a true like again there was no no, like uh, again, mega corporation that was trying to sell this with their already their the long line of uh, I guess rapport, like uh, with, with the audiences. There, w- there was none of that going there on. There was no IP. Yeah, there was none of there was. Where's n- the IP? Yeah. I'm, I'm looking to buy IP. It's that like- wasn't a thing. It was uh, you had to run off your talent, and you had to run off of, of again your ability to, to 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 hustle and convince people to get in on it. And that was my that was my introduction. I remember going school to school when I was a, a youngster, and my cutlass. Selling selling mixtapes and out of the trunk uh, uh, to people because you know we were definitely the duo that I was in. Me and Jay Don, we were pretty big uh, d- uh, during that that era. But that was my introduction to mu- that was my introduction to business. And, uh, you're doing the club scene, finding out how shady that stuff was, right? <laughs> uh, that was that was my introduction, kind of with, and I got all that experience before I had turned twenty, right? So that's why I think a lot of the business stuff. Uh, uh, worked for me. Uh, it, sp- it started with music. Let's just say that because you know I had my first band with Fire from the Gods, and then 
uh, you know, uh, we had like obviously backwards and, and, and our success. And there was a lot of business stuff that I was doing in between. And then that all led up. I took all of that experience and I threw it into, into the Riververse and made it, made it happen. But that all started when I was a teenager. It was hustle. What would you, for a young kid who's like hearing that, what is business? When I think business, right? I'm thinking like everything that comes with selling a good or service, right? Um, and there's a lot of, never mind the legal crap that you got to make sure that you have to take care of. Everybody has to. It's a headache, and uh, but it's just, you, you have to do it. But just understanding like who your your target audience is, like just little stuff like that, which you don't really pick up on. Like I think especially creatives get this really bad way where they think I'm just a very creative person. I'm the best musician in the world. I'm very talented guitarist. I can do all these sweeps. Nobody cares. I'm just being honest. Like nobody cares. Uh, or to be more accurate, you have to convince people to care about that, about that stuff. And to me, that's what I think of, of, of business. And this is why when I launched the Riververse, I came out with the code of ethics. I needed people to understand who it is that we were. Yeah. Right. This is really interesting. Yeah, it's like, in every book. At the end of the book, um, the Ripperverse Ethic. Mm -hmm. I want to read a little bit of yeah. this because it's really great. Yeah. Uh, respect the customers right at the top. We want you invested in this brand and everything that comes from it. Ripperverse Comics is not entitled to your money. And we must earn your support. Now, I can go on, but that <laughs> stuck. Uh, we are very like-minded politically in a lot of ways. Yeah. Maybe in every way. <laughs> Maybe. Um, what does that mean? You know, you're not entitled to the money. What and I think mean? I think people need to understand that um, it, it'll make business go a lot easier if people understand that you're not owed money. So again, going back to the fact that I said nobody cares. You can be the most talented person in the world. You can uh, think of yourself as this hot shot, big shot guy or gal. Doesn't matter. At the end of the day, nobody owes you anything as far as the money. You have to convince them that they value, right, and they should value this product over the dollars it is that they are giving you. And you got to convince them uh, of that. They're going to part ways. That's why I take it very seriously when people part ways, especially in this economy, part ways uh, uh, with their money. But that's your base. And I think, especially with art, and I think that's what makes it unique, it's too... And because I, I dealt with this in the music industry as well, it's way too peer driven. These people forget, and I think that's why a lot of people don't see success because these people forget who it is that they're selling to. My peers can think I'm the worst writer in the world. I don't care. They can think they can think everything about us. They can think, oh, they're better. I don't care. None of that matters to me because I'm not selling to you. I'm selling to my customers. I'm selling to the audience. I'm selling to the people um, out there. It's not about impressing you. And I think that's what uh, the, the, the trap that a lot of like, especially with Hollywood, want to pat each other on the back with everything. I think that's why a lot of these messages get thrown up in this stuff because they're not writing to the audience. They're writing, uh, you know, for the. Uh, it's almost a virtue signal in some case because they're writing to in in a way that makes them be presented as these like uh, good people, right? And like for me, it's like, bro. You're parting ways with your money. I take that very, very seriously, and I respect and value and admire everybody that goes out of the way to purchase Riververse stuff. And I make sure my staff understands that, uh, even though they might not be as impacted. They get their money regardless, right? They're contracted. They're, they're, they're on salary or hourly or whatever it is. I make sure it's instilled within this company that none of this happens. Nobody gets paid if these guys aren't satisfied with this. So that's the the approach that businessmen and women need to need to have. You need to target the the crap out of your audience, but more importantly, uh, you need to respect them. You need to respect, especially once you get them, because uh, we, we it's funny we were just talking about this last segment. What happened with Disney? Should they believe that you're not giving them what it is that they want, or worse, they were being disrespected? They'll walk They're away out. from it. They're out. Period. Um, I want to get, and I'm going to save this to go deeper later in our conversation, but I do want to get into actually just like political philosophy because you're, you are a, a deep thinker on this yeah, stuff and you've gone through your own transformation, but sort of along the way, cause there's political philosophy or economics baked into what, stuff you just said. Yeah, for sure. And what I, one of the things I heard, and I know he's a, um, I know he's a, a thinker that you admire, Walter Williams, um, George Mason. I have a lot of friends at George Mason university. Mm -hmm. 
Um, cause I did these, you know, Kane's high rap videos with Russ Roberts out yeah. of George Mason. Yeah. Yeah. And Walter Williams deli- gave the best ex- uh, explanation of the role of mon- what money is in an economy I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. And he said, money is a receipt for your contribution into the value of the society. Like that's what it is. You make a thing, you put it out there, someone values it, and that's your receipt that you get. And then you get to turn around and use that and trade it. But the underlying thing that makes that worth anything is that it's a contribution, which is why if you just print a bunch of them, there was no contribution. <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate. It? And uh, we've seen what that does to our money. But he's right. Um, I love what Walter talks about, even with like, uh, you know, the concept of like greed, right? Where he talks about, the, he used to talk about those uh, Idaho potato farmers, right? He was like, they weren't going to New York is to try to sell the potatoes because they cared about them. It was more of, they, they knew they could they could make a buck, right? And everybody, yeah. it benefits from, you know, from that. But that's what it's about. It's about filling a, 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 a void or demand, you know, per se, and money being the most common commodity, especially after they print it as much as they, uh, <laughs> as much as they do, seriously. You know, when people part ways with that sort of stuff, it is, um, it is something to take very, very, very seriously, right? Um, and, and as a businessman, going back to what it is that we were talking about yeah. before, I mean, when you see the way that people get it, you know, and they have to do their own set of, um, you know, services for someone else's job, right, um, in order to make that money, right? So it's not like it's just the government can print it out of thin air. You can't, you know what I mean? Uh, well, they're just really stealing it from you, right? Well, like, yeah. Okay, here, you put some contributions and I'm gonna water that down yeah, I'm for gonna, you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> wa- I'm gonna uh, make that not be as valuable as it, as it once uh, was, uh, you know, which is why they say, you know, inflation is kind of, uh, not kind of, it, it is a tax, you know? Uh, but seriously, uh, uh, all that being said, it's an important thing to understand and I think maybe that's where a lot of, um, aspiring be it entrepreneurs creative people wh- why it's kind of so hard for them to break through because they don't I-, I would argue that my understanding of economics just just how the world works how money works uh, the study of human action per se benefits me to your point in everything it is that I do yeah and how I navigate the world and how I navigate the riververse right it, it's such a it's such a a core part of, of that and I think if more people understood it and what it was, definitely economics, they, let's say this, they get around a whole lot of potential headaches um, uh, that, that come with being a businessman, a, a woman, because there's a lot of them, <laughs> trust me. So what was, take me back to the moment where you were like, we're do, I'm doing this. Do you have co-founders? Just me. Okay, so um, what were the key milestones at the very beginning of starting this company where you were like, I'm really in it now, and here's the things I'm doing. Was it the first, whether it's the hiring of the first employee, um, bringing in money, and now I got to make something happen? Let, p- like, play that out for the for that young entrepreneur. Like, here is what it's going to be like when yeah. you first get you got this idea, and it's and it's and you have to get started. What happens? So for me, uh, me being a commentator and having this <clears throat> bigger YouTube channel, when I floated it out there, that I was thinking about it. That was a commitment. Yeah. I'm a guy. Set expectations of your audience. Pip, pip. Like, I'm a guy, and I think that's why this worked the way that it did. I built a rapport over the last, what, 18 years of being in the public space of doing entertainment with my audience. I always delivered on everything it is that I said I was going to do. Everything. Not one thing that I like say, I'll get to it when I get to it. If I floated around there, out there, I went and got it, got it done. And I did it to the best of my abilities. Not to say that it was ever perfect, but it was to the best of my abilities. And I put my heart and soul in that. And I think people are willing to certainly invest in stuff like that. So for me, I built all this. I got all this money, right? I saved. And I said, you know, again, I floated that out there to the audience. And I was like, uh, I'm thinking about this. And which, again, that was basically a commitment. And then it was like, okay, now that I'm doing this, I got to surround myself with people that know what it is that they're doing, especially within this industry. So, you know, that's how I, I got with Cliff Richards. I got with um, with uh, uh, Gabe El Taib, who had just left D.C. Um, as a colorist, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and, the, and the ink and paint is yeah. great. I love the production of yeah. this. It's, it's just, it, it's, 
It's, it's all top notch. And stuff. that's what that's what needed to happen, right? Yeah. If I'm gonna take this serious, the audience needs to, you know, see that. They need to they need to understand that I'm not playing around. So that's yeah. what I did, right? I didn't I didn't try to take any shortcuts with it. I tried to uh and it, yeah, having I mean, I guess hindsight's twenty twenty, there's some things definitely I would have maybe done a little differently. Uh I can't complain after making three point seven million dollars on my first project, but yeah, uh, but they, yeah, pretty amazing. I, I, I could. I, there's some things that could have could have happened, and yeah, for sure, could have been better. But ultimately, it started with an idea. It started with a commitment and recognizing that I am one man. And comics, really, anything you do in business is very much a team sport, right? You can have the best and brightest ideas, but you're only one person, and you're not a genius in everything, right? You might you might be. You know, I'm really really good at this. My job. And this is what I wanted to work towards. And it really was only recently that we caught up to our demand to where I got to the point to where I'm best as an EIC and the, and the CEO of this company, right? Explain what that means. When I, when I say that, I'm meaning like facilitating basically the all of the creative stuff, all the ideas, vetting it, coming up with them, you know. Uh, doing, Executive in charge. Yes, that, that, that's what I need to be. I need to be that creatively. And obviously with the business mind it is that I have, looking at those uh, ideas and, uh, and certain points of expansion. But I'm only one man, right? So I had to get people to fill in roles that I was doing for a long, for, for I won't say a long time, but for a while there within our company. But that's what you have to do. I think that's what leadership is all about, is putting in people in positions to succeed. So having a guy like Alex be my financial operations guy or my operations manager in the warehouse uh, with, with, uh, with Brandon, these guys are phenomenal at their job and I trust them as well. That's an important thing that I think you have <laughs> yeah. to do. Uh, you gotta- Oh yeah, you, 100%. For, for me, you know, you gotta bring people in that you trust. And if you don't trust them, why are they there? I know for me, I, I make sure that these guys are set up to succeed and they'll all tell you I don't micromanage them at all. Why do I have you here? Uh, if, if I have to micromanage you, why on earth do I have you here? So we have people that I trust with the job. They do it. They do it phenomenally. But that's also what it is you have to understand, I think, uh, as a young entrepreneur, is that you can't do everything. So you need to surround yourself with people that can cover any deficiency it is that you have. And you have to have enough humility to understand what you're not good at. You got to have some sort of reflection. And I'm not saying don't don't think that you're. You know, uh, the old saying is, if you don't think you the S, nobody will. And I get that, <laughs> right? But in the same respects, you got to know, you got to, you got to understand that you're one individual. And you got to understand that you don't know everything about everything. And you put people in, in those positions to operate that part of your business, recognize it, acknowledge it, and operate it. That's why the reverse works. It wasn't just, yeah, I came up with a lot of the original ideas. But if we don't have a team to execute that, because you got to remember, it ain't just the creative stuff we're doing. We're our own distributor, right? So there's a lot. That's I, I said that. I made a lot of creatives mad when I said this. I said the creative part, that's the easy part. <laughs> Getting the logistics done. The, that's when, that's that's the, that's a different animal. That is a very, that, definitely with our volume, right? We pushed 60,000 books uh, with that first one. Like, and that's books. Over a hundred thousand individual items. If you're talking shirts and all that stuff, and we need, we had to be the ones to deliver them. And it's not like to a retailer where it's like we give them to you, y'all disperse it. No, we're going directly to the customers. That comes with a lot there, and um, uh, understanding that you got to have people in positions that know what it is that they're doing. Otherwise, something like that doesn't work. Where did you hit something where you're like, oh man, I'm at the edge of what I understand how to do here? Because that's that's that. I'm, I've been in the entrepreneurship game since I left Spike in 2011, and the best thing about it and the hardest is that like every day you're hit with something. Where something you're like, that you don't know. Like, how do I do this? I'm totally faking it right now. <laughs> I'm just gonna have to figure this out. Yeah, faking it. I don't you know mean. what I'm doing. <laughs> no, I mean the first time I would for sure say it was it, it had to do with the shipping side, the creative stuff. That was again easier, but that was my first time handling. No, it was not the first time I shipped something. But when you're talking about that volume, you know, it's just, you deal with, I got to, you know, I'm sending, I'm receiving uh, items. I got supplies and all that in our warehouse and I'm having a wear inventory. In risk. Inventory. Like that's a whole other thing. Just something as simple as the racks and all that stuff. Like it was, uh, it, it was a learning experience where I knew a little bit about it, but for sure there was a lot of learning along the way. 
um, especially with negotiations with the parcel companies um, that we work with. Um, and that's one for delivery the, for delivering the product because that's one thing that I learned very quickly. When you deal with the volume, it is that's a positive though. You deal with the volume that it is that, that we do, everything's up for negotiation. All those numbers that you see in pricing, that's all that that's not for the people that do those num do those numbers. Literally yeah. every aspect of the business when you're working with like a vendor or a supplier is up for negotiation. Now again, I, I that's where I excel there, but understanding it was that was the 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 kind of mind blowing thing is just nothing's off the tape not even something as simple as the boxes that you get all of that stuff's up for negotiation the whole entire thing is you got to talk to the right people get the best uh price when you're dealing with that, that sort of volume and yeah there's going to be some um conversations that you have to have and you got to be a little stern right that's business right you got to be you got to kind of hold your ground and i, I excel at that, I just didn't know to the degree that it was going to be like that with everything it is that we basically do as a company. Where do you think that ability to negotiate came from for you? Because that's not easy and not everybody can do it. And it requires, yeah, being able to be confrontational in a you way have that's to, like... You have to be confrontational. But it's got to be constructive. You can't just be a hothead. Correct. So you've got to have a goal in mind. Where did you... Where is that coming up from you that you're like, I have this. This is a tool in my toolbox. Well, I'll say two things. First, my mother, she was... Um, man, I just watched that woman deal with so much stuff and be able to maintain sort of a, a, a level head with it, which was uh, amazing. But yeah, going back to what I talked about earlier with the, with the rap game stuff was where I learned a lot of that, you know, with uh, the Dallas sort of hip hop scene, where I was like convincing people that had never heard of me to buy a, a CD, right. right? Where it's like, I have to convince this person. Like, uh, this person is lending me their ear. I have to now say, you, you, sh you should jam this, right? You, th you're gonna put this in your car, stereo or whatever, and you're going to love this. And having to convince people of that was a very difficult thing. And it's funny, in, in, in the game, you do it in kind of this micro way, but you also do it in this macro way where it's like, like say you go perform at a show and maybe there's a bunch of people and they don't know who you are, right? And yeah, then you, you got to bring them in. You got to bring them in, right? So there's negotiation kind of a aspect of negotiation there and interactivity that you have to consider. But I would owe it to... I would owe it to that mixtape era. I would owe it to the rap game for sure, and being able to negotiate um, is, is, I think, where that's one of my one of my my strengths is that I don't shy away from it, and I think it's because I've I've done it for a very long time. So many, you know, this is called Dad Saves America because you know I'm a dad first of all, and I look at what's going on with our kids and our culture, which to me is why I was so excited to have you on because it's like this is such a big part what you're engaged in pop culture, comic books, heroic stories, like it shaped you, it shaped me, it's shaping our kids. Yep. Where do you think like the current like young readers are? Like, do you have a sense of um, changes in culture? Like, cause this is, these are, you know, it's a youth business you're in. Yeah, it is. Um, I will say that their attention is like they grew up differently, right? Than we did, um, yeah. and I think a lot of that has to do with the ease ease of access to certain content that we didn't really have, right? Like um, it's a different era. So when promoting and when trying to get your stuff out there, you have to consider that, and it can be a little difficult. It can be a little difficult, like how you used to consume media or even learn about media is not the way that they did. It's a completely different animal. I talk about, even though I'm a relatively young guy, I was the last generation of arcade gamers. Yeah. Right? That were like, like actually grew up in the, or where the arcade was the thing to be, right? And that's not- It was a, a place th you would actually be excited to yes, go. Yes, to go to. As a kid, <laughs> was the arcade, right? That's not a thing anymore, right? Uh, it's just a completely different experience and how people learn about stuff. And now they have these mini computers and tablets and stuff that's at the, we didn't have any, we didn't have any of that stuff uh, growing up. So how we were learning about it is just different. Whereas to them, it's almost like information overload sometimes yeah. for them. And uh, it can be very, very difficult to sort of uh, break through. But I do believe there's a lot of commonalities still that are there and that they want to be uh, entertained. 
it's funny we talk about all this all this culture stuff and we talk about what is woke what is not and i think that what anime and manga which is so big among uh, the younger generation i would say it's yeah. it's bigger than what it was getting there when i was there that was when dragon ball was but it, it it's wasn't a different it, level now it wasn't like it was now in in, in the west so and uh, it's so much more sophisticated. It is. Like the it is. To, uh -huh. to even call it, to even say manga like that's one thing is yeah. like obviously yeah. not exactly. true. There's like a thousand genres. Genres of it, 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 it mixes it up and there's something, a little something for everybody. And I think that goes to, but that's something to look forward to in the same respect. The reason why I say that, uh, you know, is because that it shows that for one, there's a demand for comics because that's a comic. They just read it the wrong way. Uh, the wrong side, right? Yeah. Read it from back to front, uh, but it's a comic. At the end of the day, that's what that's what mangas are, right? It, it, it's a comic, and there's a lot to learn from from how they approach the 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 entertainment stuff. And I think there's still that demand that you have to uh, consider. The difficult thing is breaking through to them with the information overload it is that they have. And this is why I think having a the rapport that I have with the art because I needed a launching point. That's what you, that's yeah. what I needed was more than anything was like I needed a starting point that wasn't zero, and I didn't right. I had my own audience to at least give it the time of day, so other yeah. people would give it the time of day. Word of mouth is still word of mouth. It's a different word of mouth. It's not like you're literally talking to someone and maybe just posting it online to your friends, and that's something that you have to consider. But that's I think the the big difference with. The world today and, and the youngsters uh, is just how easily they're able to access material in comparison to what they were before. Yeah, we would go to the comic book store and yeah. buy this, and it was that was it. And that was it, was it. Physical, which is also, and it's like even just you're talking about production. It's like you know, just cut perfect. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of little things you take for granted yeah. with, with this, and then that's it. And then you're waiting until the next one yep. comes out, mm -hmm. and it isn't even like when I was. A, Kid, I'm 46. It was like, how you think? Like, when is that happening? You're the way you're knowing when that's happening was like magazines. Yeah, for sure. No, for <laughs> Telling sure. you when. Yeah. Oh yeah, like the upcoming, like the news you'd get through magazines, which were also a physical thing. You had to yeah. go to the like CVS to buy or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, the I want to sort of shift into into uh, your philosophy, but the way one to to bridge to that, we've talked about just entertainment, but. There is a place for, for like worldview and exploring big ideas. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you look at something like um, uh, The Watchmen, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite graphic novels. Mm -hmm. And it builds a whole world that's got a politics, it's got a statement about the nature of conflict and how it might the planet overcome it. And our, the bad guy has a kind of v vision that you kind of understand. And so that, that it is baked in there. It doesn't become the message. There's still the hero's journey. There's still flawed people trying to figure out how to accomplish the goals that sometimes they're not even sure they have. But there is a role for, for worldview and politics. So how do you, where does it, do you have a philosophy of where it goes too far? Or, or is, it, is it like you know it when you see it? How do you think about doing stuff that has politics in it, but is fundamentally still a good piece of creativity, piece of art right? versus <clears throat> propaganda. Oh. I think about this a lot because I'm very motivated by philosophy. A lot of my work is philosophically oriented. Am I just a propagandist? Like I, th <laughs> I actually, I ask myself that question honestly. You can leave questions in the comments about it. <laughs> you are a propagandist, John, uh, we know. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I'll say this much. I do love how Stan Lee put it, rest in peace, where he said he always put, if he was going to deal with like social views, he put it underlaying the plot, never to the point to where he felt like he was beating the audience over the head. It's almost a direct quote from what it is that he said. And for me, I start with universal truths. And, you know, good, evil, what is bad, what is not and starting with that is i think the way that you do it because sure there may be people that differ on certain political aspects 
But as far as uh, uh, what is good and what and for some for most people, I won't say some for most people, they understand what what that concept is. Yeah. And we often like in our in our material, we sort of entertain that. Right. And yes, there is a level of familiarity that you can put in your books that you will see it or you will read it and you'll be like, that's kind of similar to X situation that happened. So and so or maybe there was an experience in, in your sort of life. But. As Mike Barron puts it, you, the number one thing that you have to do is entertain, right? At least in our in our medium, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, people that listen to my band know that's a different animal, right? Yeah, I'm I want to talk about that too. The, I'm screaming. That's a completely different. Animal. I was screaming. At, I mean, I have a song called Self Ownership, right? Praxeology. I have a song called <laughs> like you know. So so yeah, that's there's a, some super libertarian yeah, nerd stuff going yeah, on in here, like a hundred percent. So that's a little different of, of an animal. But with like the storytelling aspect and like the comic book based medium, I entertain that differently because it's a different type of medium. The general customer base or the consumer base is a is a different type of, of, of customer as far as what it is that they value. Right. Not to say that there aren't political comics because there are not to say that there aren't, um, you know, like like legitimate satire. Like, uh, yeah. like th th that's not to say that that doesn't exist. But especially in like the superhero stuff and, and, and all those comics that are being entertained, entertaining, that's what they're leading with, number one. So that's where you have to start, right? And I don't necessarily, as a, as a, as a writer, I don't go into it with the line of thinking like, okay, I need for people to understand where I'm at politically, even if it's subtle. Like, that's not my approach. Will it naturally, this is what I was talking about earlier with like, yeah, you're you're going to have a set of guiding principles and that may influence your storytelling. And it, it, it's not even on purpose. It's just, it's who you are. It's who you, it's who it is that you are. Right. So, but that's, it's organic. Right. And it feels like that. And the audience knows that there's a difference between approaching it that way, as opposed to approaching it like, okay, this is going to be current year of the book. Right. And it's just everything. You might as well be reading, watch a CNN as you're reading my, but that's not what it is. That's not the experience that I want to give my, my writer. So embrace the current thing. Yeah. yeah. Volume one. Yeah. I, I don't want Each wanna... new one is volume one. Yeah. yeah. It's a new thing. It's the current, it's the current, current year comics is what we call it. Right. But no, see that I don't, I don't want to do that. And I just don't think it works. I don't want to say it doesn't work. I'll say that I think you're always going to hit a, a ceiling with stuff like that, right? I think if you if your aspirations are to to have something that that resi resonates with a decent amount of people, inevitably speaking, those different people are going to be different differentiating in politics and, and certain social views, which means that you have to have a level of entertaining that is universal and applies to everybody. I haven't read the comic, but I've but I'm up to up to speed on the series. What do you think about the boys? Um, it's an interesting take uh, on it, right? The boys, uh, as far as it's it's riding this line in a really interesting way, and I mean, yeah. it's sort of a it's it's dark, it is. but it's a it's a, it's a damn good show. And yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, obviously, it's it's shown that you know the, the fatigue there isn't like what a lot of people think. I think it's overstated. There, people will gravitate towards certain super superhero elements. Uh, but that's the thing. It's it's different. It's a different different feel. I think that's refreshing for some people. I think people got that with the invincible stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, where it's 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 a different approach, different change of pace to what the Marvels and the DCs of the world and what it is that they do. Um, especially with the kind of stories it is that they tell and and they entertain. But like I said, it is a. I do believe there's a ceiling. Like it's. I think those that do bad, are the ones that. Maybe the line is thin. I don't know. I don't know how thin it is. But it's like once you get there, you know that you've turned off a bunch of people and they've said no. But there's certain ways that people have been able to pull off, uh, you know, entertaining, not necessarily all of what current year is, but there's a, there's elements to it that are familiar. Let's just say that. Um, but it's like I said, it's got to be, it's got to lead with entertainment. And I don't know, maybe that line is very thin because, again, some other people try to do it and they go too far. And they suffer because of like bad, like they suffer like, hey, nobody's interested in this thing at all. So it's like what that line is, I don't know. But I think for for me and what I would encourage other people to do it is just if you start with entertaining the audience first, 
then you won't have to worry about that problem. But if you're putting like, hey, I want to tell a social narrative or a political, I got a political story that I want to make sure that's telling, I'll worry about the entertainment stuff second, your story's going to show. And people are going to pick up on it. All right. Setting the entertainment aside. You are a political commentator. Yes. And you even built your a lot of your base of your your fan base that mm -hmm. came to you and said, oh, you're starting a comic book company, I'm in. A lot of them are probably like, there were people that came to know you from your your perspective on the world. Yeah. Tell me that, how did your perspective now come about? Start from where you Ooh. first became po politically interested, engaged, like caring about issues to the world you're at now where you're geeking out about praxeology. Yeah, right, right. No, I mean, I started as, I was a leftist for sure. Um, that's some old, old, like, you probably can find me right wearing Shea shirts. I was bad, but I didn't know anything. I was very young. I didn't know anything about anything. So that's how I started. Like, when I was getting, like, it was just straight up leftism, like a uh, socialistic line of thinking. What changed for me and what did it for me was economics. Like that, the subject matter, right? As a subject matter. And I remember still being stuck in this box. I tell the story all the time. You know, I was still stuck in this hyper racialized sort of box. And I was like, even when I learned about kind of this concept, I wanted to, I was intrigued by economics. I was like, I want to learn about, I want to know what the black economists, what they got to say, right? Thank the Lord Jesus that the ones that I encountered that I resonated with was Dr. Thomas Sowell as well as Dr. Walter E. Williams. Why do you think that res they resonated with you? Well, because they would talk about... Because they're, I mean, they're titans. Literally. Especially, I mean, what we were talking about Walter Williams earlier, but Thomas Sowell is just like... He is. He's a, just a beast. Yeah, he's... Like, he's just up, <laughs> and he's still going echelon. strong. He's still 90 years old, still going. Like, it's like it's nothing. But he's hardcore. He's oh. like, he, he doesn't, he's not pussyfooting around nah, with his worldview. No, nah, he's unapologetic. That's what I love about him. But even on the sub, the, what I loved about him so much, or why I think it resonated with me when I was younger and still like into that, looking at that hyper racialized box, is that they were entertaining those ideas, right? So they were saying, okay, look at this problem of like, okay, poverty or something like that. And thinking about it in a way that, that was, yeah, okay, it's a problem, but instead of looking at it like uh, a white man bad or, or the man bad, they were looking at it more so from, okay, how do we get into this position? So let's acknowledge this this thing that maybe you don't like. Okay, let, let's go through it. And, you know, you got like Thomas Sowell and his economic facts and fallacies. You got obviously basic economics is like number one for me uh, with them. But even like with Dr. Walter E. Williams, state, the state against blacks, it's genius. That's, that's, he talks about like some of some of like minimum wage, right, and how that has historically uh, uh, hurt young, particularly young black young black men. So he wasn't afraid, and they were neither one of them were afraid to talk about some of those issues that are just general talking points. But they were coming from a place of like, okay, it was very informative, and you know, getting me to sort of understand why things are the way that they are. Let's right go. Now. I, I know I've seen uh, you out there talking about the minimum wage issue. So you're, so what, what was Walter Williams talking about? So, what did you learn from him about, about the history of the minimum wage? So, and how it has historically been used and always been used to price people out of the market, right? So what Walter E. Williams would talk about was that, look, think about it. You are in some busted up neighborhood, busted up area. You're going to a busted up school. It's crap, right? Top to bottom. He's saying that most of those types of people, or the, they, those young people that are in those situations, the place that they're going to learn the most about the world and provide value to it is in the workplace. Yeah, I totally agree. Right? My son's been get, get working at jobs in seventh grade. Period, right? That's where they're going to learn a, a lot of that, especially under those conditions where they're not going to the best, best schools and all that. And he was saying, you look at minimum wage as a means to say, okay, well, let's say that someone is, they are willing to give you that experience. Maybe they say, hey, man, I'll give you five bucks to oh, just to mop the floors. So that's all, that's all, and that'll come with a set of experiences and all that. What the minimum wage, unfortunately, does 
is say that, well, for one, it's illegal for them to, to, to hire you, right? So you can't do it. You literally, yeah, even if you're willing. It better be 15. Yeah, it, it has to be that. And they're not going to hire you for that, that amount uh, at, at all. So what's happening is you're going, you have these able-bodied people, young people, that would be better suited to learn about the world, right? Structure, everything. Um, especially if they're coming from these broken homes, right? Learning about the world in the workplace. And the government has made it illegal for them to do so. And that has hurt generations of, uh, of, young, black, of young black people, which is why even if you talk about that, and Walter E. Williams will talk about this all the time, you know, you look at the, the like minimum wage in areas where, where it gets raised, and then you look at like the demographics ha that are uh, impacted in terms of the unemployment, and it's always young black, young black uh, boys all, all the time. All the time, it's always that's always been the case. Like yeah. even from talking about the latter half of the teenage years, that's what it's young, it's young black men. Uh, in that case, minimal wage is impacting them the same way. So it was so insightful to to hear that talked about and discussed in the way that he that he does. So he takes like, hey, this is a legitimate problem that even people on the quote unquote left may can agree with in terms of the situation it is that they're in, but they're being crippled by their own government and unfortunately a lot of people are advocating for that and it's their own destruction. I know even in the early days, like in the 1930s, um, the labor unions were explicit about this. They would say, oh, we don't want That's this generation of black workers coming up to the north from the south to compete with us. That was literally why it was first implemented in America. That is, a, that is an absolute fact. It was to price black people, particularly, but also uh, uh, women and young people out of the markets by, by uh, predominantly, actually exclusively white uh, labor unions. That's a fact. That's not my opinion. Go research the Bacon Davis Act for anybody that wants to look at it. This is not, and it's funny because it's worked that way in other countries as well. Australia, South Africa, uh, you, you, or you look at these places where uh, they, were tr they were literally implementing those minimum wage laws to price people out of the market. That's how it historically has worked, and that's how it was originally implemented across various spots. No matter what people may think that it is now, when it was first implemented, that was why. It was the price, and I'm glad that you brought that up. That's, that, that's just that's not an opinion. They were pretty open about it. Like, we don't want these people, we don't want to have to compete with these people in their labor. When, um, so you encounter these ideas, and they're radical, because they're, I mean, you're not turning on TV no, at the time, no. or even now, and hearing anybody who claims to care say that. Right. And then Walter Williams and Thomas Sowell and others, but especially those two, uh, as far as like prominent black intellectuals, yes. Yes. Are, are, are just, they're saying it. They're, they're saying this is the reality. And, and um, what does that start to do in your mind? Does that open doors? Are you, you know, I, I think there's some people, I, some people, they, they get this one door open and like the dominoes. That was, that's what it was for me. It was the rabbit hole. Once I learned about them, one thing turned into another. So you go from reading about them and definitely the concept of economics and definitely when you're floating around soul, you're just talking about like more Chicago econ economics. So that leads me into the Milton Freemans of the world, the Hayek's, uh, uh, well, let's say start with Milton Friedman. And then we go to more on the Austrian side of things, maybe even Milton Friedman's son, David, yep, uh, yep. or, or um, you know, definitely once you go Austrian, you're talking, you know, the Hayek's uh, of the world, Mises, uh, uh, again, that's why I kept bringing up human action because of, of that. And that's just a rabbit hole. So it literally was, about, it was one thing, That's that was my entry, entry level. And then all that, and I went full blown rock bar by the end of it. Uh, but it all started with Soul and and, and, and uh, Dr. Walter E. Williams. That's how, that's what it was for me. Yeah. What about those ideas changed for you in terms of how you live your life or how you think about your daily choices? I would say everything. Look, I was very much again a socialistic, collectivistic. That was kind of my line of thinking when I was young. I became a lot more individualistic, which doesn't mean that like, hey, I, I don't care about anybody. I actually looked at it more in a positive light in that, well, my world only moves if I move it type of situation. Taking responsibility. That's what, and accountability. Those were 
I think what came from my just learning about economics, that's what came from that is that individuality and, you know, less excuses. Definitely once you read, I mean, it's hard to, you read some of this stuff by soul and it's like, you feel like you can conquer the world and you really want to take like responsibility um, uh, uh, for yourself. Definitely when you realize just how people that in previous generations had it way better than I ever had, including them, right? Uh, 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 Or like in previous generations, I had it better than them. And, and like, what excuses do I have to be making here? I have, I mean, in comparison to the previous generation, my mother's generation, my grandmother's generation, especially, I have access to things that they never would have been able to even conceptualize in terms of opportunity. So I need to be taking advantage of it. So I would say that that's what economics and learning that, again, the more Chicago and Austrian uh, economics, not this Keynesian nonsense, uh, I learned more about that. And because I learned more about that, it impacted my daily life because it, it, it allowed yeah. me to understand that, again, the world moves if I if I move it for it's not going to move if someone else moves it for me. And there's a lot of that's a liberating thing, I think. Once you start realizing that and look, yeah, there are going to be external factors that you can't control. But those are are are. Are uh, uh, what it is. It's funny, you know, going back to the music stuff and, and the rest in peace to Kyle, but We Came as Roma is one of my favorite bands. And there's a song lyric where uh, he was like, he says, Don't let yourself think that you control anything beside the way you live your life. So it's like, it's a yeah. genius. Qu- it's essentially saying that I can't. I can't, I can't control that. I can't control what you do. I can't control what anybody in this room does. I can't control what anybody outside this, uh, outside of this building does. I can't, I can't possibly control it. What I can control are my own actions, right? And I sh- that's what I should lead with. But that all started with, with the economists that it is that, that I was uh, sort of uh, learning about during, during my younger years. And thank God, because it could have it it went bad, <laughs> for sure. I um, uh, recently released a video uh, I'm doing these sort of these essays, and I really went out on a limb for myself because this is new a new territory for me. I'm, I've I've always been behind the camera, so doing my rap videos and my weird cronies animations yeah. and all kinds of nonsense, all kinds of like Gen X slash Boomer nonsense. <laughs> but um, it was about this movie, Leave the World Behind, yeah. that um, the Obamas were executive producers on, and my. And I really dug into this and I referenced soul and talking about because like under the surface of it is this sort of divisive identity politics. And um, and I have kind of come to a point in my life as an adult. where I'm like, this is just this is just telling kids they can't make it. And I'm not going to be I'm not going to sit silently just because I'm like a a white guy, although I'm Italian. So I never thought of myself white to begin (laughs) with. But like, uh, I'm done with that. This is not right. You can't tell kids that they're that the system's rigged against them. And that they can't make it because they're black or they're brown or whatever, uh, BIPOC, all these like increasingly globular alphabet soups yeah. that that are everyone but me, I guess. Yeah. And you're you've been out there, you've you've been one of those voices out there pushing back on this stuff. What is your message? You know, you in a way you just gave a great one, but more broadly, like what is your message to a young African American? kid or a white kid who's getting hit with this stuff yeah well that i would would say it's going both ways right you have one sort of um being told that they're the victim in essentially every situation and the other even though they've not done anything to anybody that just by sheer existing they have somehow caused a problem and they need to acknowledge that and it's insulting on both ends like right so one's the supposed victim the other's the supposed oppressor and i say to that that's nonsense right um again going back to what we were talking about before you have to acknowledge yourself as an individual. And that's why I have such issues with these narratives that people push where like, I have, I mean, if, if people listen to our band backwards, um, You Are You is a song that we, we did. Um, and it's one of my favorite songs that me and Alex had, had, uh, had sung on that, on that Veracity album. And we actually talk about this, this very topic um, where you know Alex is coming from his perspective, and I'm and I'm coming from mine. Where you know Alex is saying basically he can't be held responsible for like something his ancestors uh, did, and I'm on the other hand saying the exact you know same thing where I can't be victimized by something I didn't experience. Right? As though I hate the whole term legacy of slavery. I had never been a slave in my life 
That's never been a thing. That's nothing that I can, I, I've experienced. And you've never owned any slaves, right? <laughs> well, none of my ancestors got here. It, it, exactly. was, it was long gone before my first Ex well, ancestors let, let, set let, foot here. Let these types tell it you're still supposed to take uh, responsibility for it, even though you weren't here. You know what I mean? Hell, the, the Nigerian American is supposed to somehow feel some kind of way about American slavery that, that his, his lineage literally they'd never experienced uh, uh, that. But that's how just psychotic, unfortunately, these narratives are. But at the root of it, what it is, is it's trying to beat into the brains of these young people that there is nothing in their control and the world just is what it is. I think that's a dangerous line of thinking. I think it it actually stifles sort of um, entrepreneurship. Um, uh, you're not going to, you know, you, maybe someone doesn't give it a try. Yeah. Maybe it's some wonderful invention that they were, they, they were, God put them on this earth to do exactly that, but they never take that leap. They never take that risk because they feel as if the world it's just what it is, and there's nothing that they can do in terms of the outcome because the decision has been made by, from a societal, cultural uh, perspective uh, uh, by other people. And I, and I just despise that. I actually hate it because uh, everybody's an individual. They should be looked at um, as such. And I hate this, this, this line of thinking where people are supposed to either feel some kind of way and feel bad about themselves for things that they never experienced and things that they never did to other people or, um, and on the other hand, feel like they, they've done something like I, like you, you see some of this stuff. I know people, you know, uh, they call it whatever terms, but you know, you're a dad and you could see some of the stuff that it definitely in some of these public schools that they are teaching these young, young kids. And I just couldn't imagine. I just can't imagine like my child, Hearing that, I can you can imagine having a white child hearing some some things like that, which oh, yeah. is basically saying that you're the problem with everything that's wrong uh, right now, or some, telling some little black kid that he'll basically never amount to anything unless someone else has to assist him in everything it is that he's done because the world is against him, and that's uh, so he has to kind of see ghosts, and that's just crazy to me, man. To play devil's advocate is um, where are we being unfair? Like is like people are tribal. People see colors, you know, especially with race where it's visual. Yeah, it's not like an identity thing that's kind of below the surface. Right. Is it unfair? Are we not given the devil is due that look that people are tribal and they're gonna judge things like and they are I, I in like simple horrible ways sometimes and to pretend that's not a problem is just being panglossian and naive. I, I do think that, yes, two things can be true, that there are obviously pieces of crap out there that want to do evil things, but what I think happens is that it's often over-exaggerated or in some cases just made up because the people need a boogeyman. The, ju the, jussy, the, the yeah, ju juicy small yays, as uh, <laughs> Chappelle uh, called them. Like, yeah. Juicy. Uh, yeah. You just got to make It's made up. He literally made up the whole thing, but that's yeah. the thing that I'm talking about with these race hustlers, right, is that they are having, they're going out there and making stuff up. So while there may be th people out there, it's not nearly to the degree of what it is that they're perpet they perpetuate. Look, I can, you can acknowledge that you know, you're Italian. You can acknowledge that I'm, I, I'm black. There's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with that, but that should not be the defining trait of that person, and they are an individual. Uh, and yes, there are going to be people that maybe feel bad, feel some kind of way, may gravitate towards to, 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 to one side or the other, but it doesn't have to be malice. Is the is the uh, I think the point it is that I will more so want to make on this, which is why uh, I just I really despise these sort of narratives because it sets people up uh, 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 for, for for failure. R really, is what it is that it, that it's doing. So yeah, two things can be be true. You can acknowledge I'm black, but that's not all there is to me. I'd be pretty boy. I'd be a pretty boring guy. Um, and there are some pretty boring people out there, I guess, to be fair, where that's the only thing interesting about them is is whatever gender stuff uh, or whatever sexuality or whatever race it is that you are. And oftentimes these are things that aren't even in your control. You've used a term several times in here that we haven't talked about that much on the show, but which I, I've read plenty of Rothbard. I'm quite sympathetic to. And that is a narco-capitalist. So what is that? <laughs> well... Look at it in the libertarian sense of the, I guess, the the furthest one can go to being a libertarian is what, the way that I word it. In a sense that where 
you often think of modern libertarianism in a more minarchist approach where the government should exist, markets are better, but there's just a few different things like courts, security, whatever. National defense. National defense, where the government should be there and should be doing that. All the anarcho is the way I word it, all the anarcho-capitalist does is say, well, we accept that the market is better suited to deal with everything else. Why not those things as well? It's basically all that it is to it. Now, me, I'm, a, I'm rational about this. Like, I'm, I'm very much a realist, right? Uh, I'm not a everything needs to is, is, it just end tomorrow or nothing else. Right. I'm very much I wouldn't call myself a pragmatist. I don't really like that term, but I understand that nobody's snapping their fingers and we're going to be in the handicap society tomorrow. That's just not. And I believe that there's a lot that has to get done uh, culturally um, a, a, as well. So that's why I'm not like against coalition building and why, you know, libertarians, no matter where you're at, you know, you're my outlaw as far as I'm, I'm concerned. We're all moving. It's like a train and we're all moving in one direction. Maybe you're getting off a little earlier than I am. Right. Uh, <laughs> you're staying to the, to the. I'm going all the way. <laughs> you're going to do it. It's like, oh, we stopped with tracks. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now we're off the tracks. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm going all the way and you and, and they might. But no, I, obviously, they're all my allies as far as I'm concerned. We're all fighting the same fight. Uh, and we're trying to deal with the world as it is and trying to build about more free or more prosperous uh, uh, society. So this term, this philosophy, is worth talking about a little bit right now, in particular because Javier Malay, the president of Argentina, just got elected last year, at the end of last year, and calls himself an anarcho-capitalist. He's a hardcore, he's reading all the books we've been talking about, mm -hmm. and he's in, like, disaster town economic-wise Argentina. It's like, how, have you been following that? Oh yes. How oh, do you? Yeah. How has that impacted the way I, you I, think about the world we're living in right now? No, I I love it for this reason. For for whatever reason, Americans have conceded that a person like that, this whole populistic approach to just sound economics, because I think that's the important thing about uh, Javier that we need to acknowledge. He was unapologetic. Oh yeah. Uh, in terms of his, his his libertarianism, like it was that's what that was that was his campaign. Yeah. It wasn't anything he was trying to hide. It wasn't anything he was trying to mask. It wasn't one like oh hey I infiltrated and then I ch no. he was leading with it and the people got behind it right. And this you know I remember posting about this what has happened. I was like how in the world did Argentina of all places beat America? <laughs> in terms of getting a libertarian, we're the ones that talk about liberty, 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 and all these documents, and they got a libertarian president before we did. And I guess you got the one way to look at it is that it had to get pretty bad for them to yeah to 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 do that. But I look at that as nothing but a positive. It shows that yes, people can lead with that, and it resonate with 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 uh with the audience like a, a like a lot of people it can resonate with. You can you can lead with that. You don't have to be wishy-washy with your position because you think, oh, well, it's a little too radical that, no, you can, it, it just, you got to make it make sense. And that's what Javier would do. He'd go on these shows, he'd be arguing with people, he didn't care because he knew his stuff, right? He, and he often knew more than they did and he was able to explain himself and be able to communicate those, those different ideas and he was very, very passionate and people resonated with that. I love to see something like that happen in America. He is, and I, I actually get frustrated to get really into political stuff because, you know, you get these people who, especially quote people on the quote unquote right, who saw Javier and they're like, "Oh man, this guy's awesome." And I'm sitting here like, "Well, y'all had a version of that, 2008 and 2012." Instead, you wanted John McCain and Mitt Romney. Yeah, that's true. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I got into all these ideas. I'm, we're sitting here right now because of that guy, because of, <laughs> yeah, uh, another I, I, a Texan, yeah, Ron Paul, yes, fellow Texans. Um, and he, uh, he, and similar stuff, like weird so, sort of soft-spoken old man talking about geeky economics, getting on stage after 9-11 saying, we're over there bombing people. This is, the CIA calls this blowback and Rudy yeah. Giuliani being like, you take that back, how dare you? How dare you say this about America? It really is interesting. Like it's, it's interesting how a voice can come from nowhere that nobody thinks would resonate like all this stuff you were saying about targeting the audience earlier but i don't i bet you don't target the audience 
Yeah. I bet you do what Rick Rubin does, and it's like, do I love this? Is this awesome? All right, let's do it. Put it out. Yeah, put it out. That's my approach, and I think, again, that's what resonates with it, though. Like, that's what resonates with the audience, and that, that people respond to that. People will gravitate towards that. You just got to be honest, man. You just got to be real. I think the authenticity, man, is the easiest marketing ability. I don't care what you're in, politics, business, whatever you're in, definitely in this day and age, because everything seems so fake. Um, so it's a breath of fresh air. It's like the it costs you nothing to just be yourself. Even people might disagree with it, but they respect. I mean, people, you get people. Oh man, I, I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of of, uh, of this position it is that Eric has, but I love him. So you know, and you you laid it out like, okay, there's nothing you want the government to do. Nothing. Yeah. Zero. Zero. It was Go up, away. It was up to shrink me. to the size of the. You know what is it like? Uh, Shrink to the size of a thimble, yeah. or shrink small enough to drown in a bathtub, and then drown it. Yeah. You're there. You're there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, what has been the most challenging argument to your position? Where do you honestly go, whew, I, I, that is tough. I, I'm going to be honest. There isn't one. I, I'll give you one better, and that's what people know me for, my great Marauds rant that I went on. Uh, that's the most frustrating one to have to field. Because everybody defaults to it. For some, who's gonna do the roads? It's ev that's the who's going to roll flat concrete? <laughs> yeah, like, oh, there's no way that the people that build the complex vehicles could roll the concrete. That, uh, yeah, it's. it's <laughs> I, so I, I will say that it's. Not, it's like the stupidest it response. Is, it is. It is. <laughs> I, so I will say that there's not one necessarily that I've hit that I was like, oh man, I, I, I like I think that's difficult. Either if I, and then that doesn't mean that I have the answer to everything. It more than likely means someone else has entertained that, and that's the cool thing about liberty. Like it's funny about the this whole role staying. Walter Block has like a a massive like. I don't know how many pages that freaking essay is of him saying, okay, you wanted an answer? Who gonna, how, how are we going to do this? Bam, here it is. And he breaks it down yeah. like to a science, man. Like there's nothing to refute there. But it is such a, it's, it, it, I would say that. That's the most frustrating. It's the most frustrating one. And it's often the it's default, just, who built the roads? And it's us. Uh, I think it's like two thirds of the roads in Sweden are managed by private yep, companies. Yep, something yep. like that. It's like, it's like, uh, <laughs> it, 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 How I mean, do we overcome? <laughs> do you think that we're in a time? You're a new media yeah. entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. We're in this time that's really, really interesting. When we think like big picture, when we think about our kids, when we think about the world, where it's like you can kind of customize your whole life of of information flow. Yeah, like I can make I can make my information world whatever I want it to be, and some of that's amazing. A lot of it's amazing. I can. I can learn about economics without having to have some horrible professor that's teaching me Marxist nonsense. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I have to sit there and be like, this guy's an idiot, and now I'm going to go read on the side. It's like, no, I can do this all myself. Uh, but it, it, it is like we're, we, we are in a time where it's like, well, we're all reading different stuff. We're all going down different echo chambers, right? Like, do you think about that like, as a philosophical person and as somebody like cares about the future? Do you worry that like the things that are exciting also have this sort of dark feed feedback loop where like what does truth even mean in twenty twenty four? Yeah, I, like, I, I, what does it mean? Like that's a, that's such a good question. I mean, for me, it's like I, I'll say this much: divisiveness doesn't bother me as much as I think it does for other people. My issues that come with it are when people think that it's proper to use aggression upon people because they are not aligned with them on whatever topic, right? I'm okay with people gravitating towards wherever they, wherever they go, like-minded individuals, groups of people for that matter. It doesn't bother me. The issue is when you try to force that on every other individual and you feel like that is the righteous position. This is why I feel like our political philosophy is not I feel, I know it is the only moral one because it's the only one that allows you to do that. Yeah. Whereas, you want to you want to create a communist commune in Texas, you can do that. You can do that. You can't create a, a mini Texas in 
the North Korea. Bingo, right? That we will allow them to do their what they want to do. They won't allow us to do what we want to do. So we have the moral, we have the moral position. So that's why I say about what well, that's that's also my approach again with the whole divisiveness thing. It's not something that I that I that I fear or anything. I'm okay with people again finding those pockets of uh, 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 places that and, and and theories and ideas, whatever. I'm okay with that. The difficult thing is trying to get people to understand, okay, I'll embrace your 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 uniqueness or whatever it is, world it is that you want to see. How do I convince that person to keep that within in a voluntary means? Mm -hmm. Is the is the is the conversation that I think we should be having less about what and more about okay, can you keep that to other people that agrees to you? Or is it going to bleed out, which is what most people want, where it's enforced upon everybody else because they feel like they have the righteous or just position. I think that's where it gets dangerous. That's where the conflict happens. That's where I, I would argue that, you know, this whole forceful kind of integrationist approach got us in a lot of uh, issues, right? You mean in terms of this post-civil rights? Of, not, uh, not necessarily. Well, that was a problem. What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, when I, when I say integration, I'm talking about of general ideas. I wasn't even talking about like on, on, on the racial is issues, but that can be something, uh, you know, Brother Malcolm X talked about this all, uh, you know, all the time. You know what I mean? About how, look, we just want to do our own thing. Just stay out of our way. That's all that we're asking. I mean, that's something, that, that same argument was happening. That's what, look, I want to go on a rabbit hole on tangent on this show, but there's a big difference between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr.'s view of things. Just like it, and that same debate was happening between W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, where, where one was more get out of my way and let me do things, right? But what, I, what it is that I'm saying or why I brought that up is that a lot of conflicts happens because we've seen this all throughout, like not just American history, but just history in general, where you force these people who are diametrically opposed culturally to be yeah. with each other, and it creates violence. It creates a lot of turmoil. It creates uncertainty and 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 and, and unstate. It's the, the area, geographical area, is unstable. So that's why I don't lean towards that way of trying to get everybody on the same page. It's more, I'm okay with you being on that on, on the page. It is that you on. Just limit it to your bubble. That's it. That's all I require of you is just to limit it to that and don't feel like you have to force or you can or you even righteous to try to force someone else to be a part of that. That's where it becomes a core problem. It is interesting because like America, how do you think about, you know, this is, we call this, call this show Dad Saves America because even though I'm high, very sympathetic to everything you're saying, um, I more or less see myself that way philosophically. But... I do love what America stands for, what our principles I are. Absolutely. I think they're incredibly radical. I think you could even say that Thomas Jefferson was like pretty car close to an anarcho-capitalist philosophically. Read the Declaration of Independence. That's what, that's what I tell it people is. all the time. They were like, I, I interviewed um, Gordon Wood, who's this famous historian. He's like, the way he put it was, you have to understand something about that time. The British were the most like radical in Europe with the Magna Carta and like radically individualistically liberty oriented and the Americans were so radical that they were they were like the radicals of the radicals yeah. and um, and so I love that I think it's like the enlightenment brought to life um, do you think of how do you you're nodding how do you think about America how do you think about as someone who's like the state shouldn't exist well that would mean technically America as a government wouldn't exist but the culture can still exist yeah so how do you think about that that that's the way i feel about it the way i look at it, i li look less about the government setup and more about those set of principles right i say this i'm talking about texas right i believe texas especially as a geographical area has its own kind of unique it's why I, I, I want to you know live and die here right i love i love being in texas because there's no other place like it. It's a set of kind of traits and attributes that is dip, that is just vastly different. But to your point regarding America, uh, I'm right there with you. Like those, I mean, think about it. The core tenets or the principles or the concepts that we think of Americanism that you're talking about are almost identical to what libertarianism is and what it upholds, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't have any issue with that as, as, as a culture by by any means. I think it's something worth being embraced. That's why I don't get bent out of shape when people talk about that, like, oh, they love their they love their either state or they love their country and more. So I'm like, 
I ain't got no problem with that. I, I have no problem with that because I'm right there with you. It's about those concepts, though. That's what we're leading with. It's about those principles, those uh, those actual principles that come like what it means to be an American. Why, yeah. again, we talked about it earlier. Liberty is so entertained of a concept. There's all all these documents that, and then they continue to use that as like a, a an important word. It's part of their vocabulary. I'm all for it. I'm all for that. Are you an optimist? Or a pessimist? Optimist. Why? I'm white pill all day long. Um, because I'm a living, breathing example of change. Uh, it, it, not just from where I came from. We talked about We entertained some of that stuff here. But even when I look at what we did with the Riververse, all, this was not supposed to happen. They said this was not supposed to happen. People trying to talk me off the ledge. You shouldn't do this. Why are you doing everything on your own website? People won't ever gravitate towards these new characters. Comic books are dead, all this other stuff. And here we are. Multi-million dollars. Uh, actually, we're on our third million dollar campaign right now with Alpha Core, uh, which says a lot. So, I, and I'm not saying that like that's that means that that's like the entire like landscape of America. I'm saying it's just an example of it. I ain't the only success out, out there by any means. I'm just I'm just living it, right? So I'm an I'm an optimist because you know I've I've had the opportunity to get out there and speak with people. That's why I love to do these events. It is that we do. It be the cons that we go to where I get to look fans and supporters in the eyes and and uh, you know they get to say, hey man, I read this, it changed my life, or I saw this, heard her talk about this, it got me through X X Y and Z. It's real stories from real people. And um, that's why I'm I'm a bit big, big, big. I'm a massive optimist. I don't even like being around people that are like doom and gloom. That's not my thing. It's not my thing. I, I, it's the energy that I don't want around me. I'm like, it, again, it goes to what we were talking about early. We talk about this individualistic stuff. Like, we got to be able to change the world that we, you know, to to be in the view that we want it to be. You know what I mean? Or, or, or whatever views it is that we have, we want that, and we have to do the work to make that make that thing happen. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to require a lot of work, and I'm okay with that. My son, in early, in, in seventh grade, he, he wrote, he read um, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. He's a, a psychologist that went through the Holocaust. The half, it's a very difficult book, because half of it is about his experience in all of the worst concentration camps. And then the second half is the psychology of how to survive that. Yeah. And he quotes someone, but it, this is the core of the book, that, and, and I, I'm sort of, this has become like a mantra. That, and you've already said it. That the last human freedom is that our freedom, no matter what, even in Auschwitz, to decide how we respond to our circumstances. That's it. And this show, like, like my, I'd even say my philosophy has become, in a sense, recognizing that. I love that. Because I don't think it's the last human freedom. I think it's the first. I love that. You know? That's what you're saying. You're yeah. saying, like, no, I don't care what's going on. I'm, I can choose to be optimistic. I can choose to say, hey, Marvel has become woke nonsense and splintering the universes and becoming an <laughs> incongruous, discontinuous nightmare. I'm going to make my own universe. Yeah. And just do it. Yeah. There's nothing more American than that. You're, you're completely correct. And... Again, it's a, it's a reason to be optimistic, and I hope if nothing else, what people take from you know what it is that you know we've discussed here, and what it is that you know I'm sure we talk about in our own individual like lives with other people is is exactly that. It's that look, man. Um, set of circumstances are the set of circumstances, and we got to make the most of that, and it's not gonna fall in our laps. It's one of those things that's going to require movement. It's going to require us going out there and actually doing something about it. And I, I, that's, the, that's the way I want people to think. I want people to think less everything sucks and it'll never get better and more, okay, set of circumstances are just that. So now what? Are you going to kind of tuck your tail and just say, oh, it is what it is? Are you going to use the bodily autonomy it is, that minimum you have, to be part of the change in the direction at minimum that you want to, again, manifest? Uh, it's a very individualistic approach, but uh, I found that having that, it makes everything easier. And, you know, you, you start to see kind of the, the, the positivity of it all and the progress of it all. 
uh, in various avenues when you look at it through that lens. Um, let's talk a little bit before we wrap up about your circumstances. So your family life, your background, you've alluded to it, but we didn't get into it. And I don't know, I don't know your, your whole, your story. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, paint that picture for me. What was your, what was your childhood like? What was your early, what was your family situation? I mean, you know? I, I was a knucklehead. So I, for lack of better terms, <laughs> I was, I was, a, I was a knucklehead. Um, you know, I grew up gang banging. I grew up doing a lot of just absolute foolery that could have ruined my life. And we, I did see it ruin the lives of many, many people. How'd um, you get sucked into that? Environment, right? You, 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 um, you know, you're around all of this and, you know, the old cliches of like, ah, you know, you want to, you know, you, you want a sense of belonging and all this. So you get pulled into doing dumb stuff. And, you know, I don't want to give myself too much credit. I just think I was just stupid. It, like, for real. Like, I was an aggressively stupid human being uh, during those times. I think all teenage boys are. You know, that's kind of design. What it's like, it's kind of part of our, you know, and it, it just shows in different ways, we're, right? We're built for most likely being sent off to die yeah. fighting the other idiots. Yeah. In the tr in, in, at, with the other tribe. That, that's that's <laughs> about what how, how it works. But that's how it was for me, right? Um, you know, single parent household. My mother and father actually were together when I was born, and they split. Um, and that kind of just changed everything. Went from being in a house to being in an apartment of Camp Wisdom in uh, Dallas, Texas. And you know, I was a knucklehead. I was I was a prime knucklehead doing d dumb stuff. Saw a lot of stupid stuff happen. To, uh, just unfortunate things. Homies die. Uh, being a part of uh, stupid wars and all this stuff, and it was just, um, it was just foolery. And did you get full into? We had, I was saying before we were rolling that we had Anton Lucky, and who's mm -hmm. in Dallas, and he started the Bloods in that's Dallas. What, that's what, that's what I was banging. Ironically enough, you know what I mean. And it's like, you know, looking at South Dallas, I'm from Oak Cliff, right? You know what I mean? And that's just what everybody was doing during the time. And it was, and to be fair, it was less colors. It was more, when I was coming up, it was more territorial. It was like, that's how stupid it was. You could be from, you could be claiming the same colors as somebody, but they from this side of the hood versus yours. And now y'all beefing. For what? That's how stupid it was. This is why I don't I don't like to I don't I don't like to do the sob story thing. Like I was just young and I was just impressionable and I was stupid. Let's just call it what it was dumb. Uh is is what it was. Looking back at it, I'm like, that was the dumbest thing that I that I did. I drove my mother up a wall, though she again is as she was able to deal with it, but I drove her up a wall. I knew I did. I made life way harder for her than what I ever should have, and I made life harder for the people around me. Um and, and thankfully, I got it out of it. And what did it for me... I was just going to ask, uh, like, how did you escape what that? What did it for me was someone that I was with at the time, there was a group of cats that were... It wasn't nothing. I was, when I say I was insane, I was insane. It wasn't nothing for me to go to a group of people and just want to fight. Like, I don't care how many of you is. I know I'm getting jumped. It's 10 of y'all. We're going to duke it out. That's how... I was just nut. But having someone around me that had absolutely nothing to do with that and then putting them in jeopardy, like it let off a switch in, in, in me. Like, wait a minute, was this a girlfriend? Yeah, it was or his girlfriend at the time, right? Uh, and that was that was that was when it clicked for me. Like, wait a minute, this isn't just impacting me. Somebody else could get hurt. Do you feel like that was that innate male protector? Yeah, thing it had clicking been, in. Yeah, for sure. Because it's like that's like why would that matter? Yeah. Like you're with your it, friends that, and they're all. That's exactly what it is. It's like it hit a switch in me and I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's one thing for me to get jumped. It's another thing for someone else that has absolutely nothing to do with anything that's going on to not be a part of this. And it just it was like, I can't be doing this. And getting away from Dallas was really good for me. Thankfully I was a you know a hell of an athlete. That was my ticket out. Uh, going to University of Memphis right out of right out of college, excuse me, right out of high school, uh, on, uh, on track and field scholarship. I obviously I ended up finishing my my track career at Texas A&M Corpus Christi, but you know it was good for me. It was good. I mean, I was kind of phasing myself out of it anyway during that age, yeah, but that, that broke it. Yeah, but that for sure, I needed to get away, and it, it, it for sure, I was once I was out, I was out. So it's like, uh, yeah, it was such a stupid thing, man, and. You know, I, I do try to use the platform it is that I have. I talk about it a lot just to tell people how just 
idiotic and stupid that it was that I was doing what I was doing, and it could have ended another way. It could have ended ended another way, and for a lot of people that did what I did, that's that's the way that it ended in another way. They didn't get the opportunity that I got. Do you have something that when you meet a kid and you know they're doing nonsense, they're they're in gang stuff, they're in crime, they're what do you say to them? If if I could talk to, and I've had my opportunities um, to to at least like discuss with with some cats that are at least doing goofy stuff, even if it's not directly gang related, just doing stupid stuff. If I can pull them aside and chat with them, I will because. You know, when you're young, you mentioned like being a teenager and kind of how rebellious you are and all that stuff. But you think that you're going to live forever. You think that you're invincible. Uh, you think that nothing's ever going to happen to you. And that's just not the case. Right. It's just that's just not the reality. The reality is something can happen to you. Uh, and in some cases, it's the point of no return. So I do want to I try to talk to with folks and when I do get that get that opportunity and just explain it from that perspective. Like, I've been there, done that with them, so I'm from the game. It ain't much you can tell me um, about, well, you don't know my... Nah, I've been there, done that. But it's more of you need to understand and you need to get in, get in a step because you're not going to live forever. And making those sort of mistakes that, that, that people, are, unfortunately, are making, it's to one or two ways off the dead or in jail which one you want and uh i don't want that and i don't wish that upon anybody uh so when i do get the opportunity you know that's sort of my my perspective is just you just get off this this, this goofy stuff man and then you hand them a thomas soul book yeah that's what did it for me if i can get them to read thomas soul that'll change anybody change my life so hopefully for a lot of people like hey man you want to know about some kind go look up this go read for economic facts and fallacy, fallacies or what's that other one uh that White liberals are really good. White liberals and was and black rednecks. Red, black rednecks and white liberals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. It's like you think this is your culture. This isn't this even. Nah, not this even. This is some old weird <laughs> yeah. Scottish nonsense yep. imported. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, go read that. Maybe you're getting stepped in. There you go. You've mentioned a couple times in passing in this conversation, uh, faith or yeah. God, Jesus. Yeah. Faith, like, were those were those offhanded comments, or just do you no, have a that, religious? No, that, do you have a religious uh, oh, part of your life? A hundred percent, man. Me being me being Christian, and we talked about it earlier. Me being kind of a uh, uh, having those set of guiding guiding principles and set of uh, you know morals is is obviously very important to me. Became way more important. Um, just understanding the just you know for me. <sighs> Where'd you get that? Did you were you raised Christian from yeah, your mom? I was cr raised Christian, but. You know, it doesn't really set in until, for me at least, until I was an adult. Obviously, I got out of doing all the nonsense, and it's like, there's got to be something else at play here, and there's got to be another sense of, of meaning or purpose for me to get the chances and opportunities it is that I have. So my, my journey was not meant to end doing the gangbanging stuff or doing any of the other creative stuff. Uh, it, like I, I, got, I got a sense of purpose here. And there's somebody there that's guiding me sort of in that direction. Um, it's hard to believe otherwise, just considering my own experience. That's the way that I see it. There's a lot of young people that seem like they are, you know, there's a God-shaped hole in their heart or they don't know, they don't have that sense of purpose. Like when, when, like when it comes to brass tacks, is that the place you feel like is the best place to start? Like find, find faith? Absolutely. I, I would have... I would recommend that for anybody. I mean, before the to the soul and all that stuff, get right with God, man. Just read. I mean, just pick up a Bible and just read it. Just like start at Genesis. Just read it, like straight up. Just 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 read it, right? Greatest story ever told. Yeah, <laughs> just <laughs> just read it, man. And I think that would do a lot for these 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 people, these broken. There's a lot. Of, I mean, I, I hate to see it, man. Especially with this, these young people. You probably feel me more than this. Definitely with you being a dad. I haven't got there yet, but. Just how grim and dark and and ugly, man, like uh, it, it can be. And I just I look at like, where is that sense of optimism for the youth, right? And and yeah. and, and, and maybe again that that's what's necessary is instilling some sort of uh, you know understanding with God in them will help because I don't think that it's an accident that as people trend uh, opposite of God, 
you've also seen a whole lot of uh, issues that have uh, increased over this past uh, generation, particularly mental mental health wise. And I think that's because we we uh, you've seen them stray further away from them. I don't think it's a coincidence that all the worst dictatorships in the 20th century were all like explicitly godless. The Soviets, Mao, all these Marxist Pol sort of Pot. hellholes. Oh. They were all like, no, kill God first. Yep. That way you're all a bunch of sheep Stop. that I can yep. grind. All of it. All of it. I believe that, that yeah, that's 100% true. That's, that's, that, that's what they want to sort of work out because they do understand that that comes with, op that optimism comes, comes with that good comes with that and doing great things comes comes with that and uh you can see where that can get in the way of people that want to do very very bad things to innocent people do you think um you know we've talked about race and stuff and we've talked about your upbringing uh, anecdotally it mm -hmm. feels to me like there's a transformation taking place among black black americans that are that are becoming and I, I'm really going on a limb here because I'm making some generalizations that are probably a bunch of nonsense. But it does feel like there is an awakening towards, hey, there's a lot of other ways to think about politics like you've yeah. experienced. That your experience is actually a prototype that's going on out there in the world. I imagine from your platform that you probably, you're in a better position than I am to hear people say, Eric, I've had you, your life, that you're, what you've shared with me, I've had this experience. Like, tell me about this. What have you Absolutely. observed? Absolutely. Look, that that is the honest to God's truth. People are, uh, particularly young black people, um, are understanding that there's other options, right? We kind of, for a while, there was this, like high minded thinking, and it just, if you were black, you had to, especially in the political realm, think a certain way. And that was just the exception. The current president said it in really yeah, that, raw, yeah. horrible he, terms. He literally said it. He literally said <laughs> it. You don't vote for me. You ain't black. Yeah, that's what he said. And of course, he throws in the ain't because it's like that whole. Ah, uh, yeah. He's I've got, got a cold switch, you know. I got to do that. I got to yeah, do that. It's the hot, that so hot sauce in the purse. Here, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, the affect. Add the affect. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> But, but but no, uh, yes, I've seen, I, I do believe that now more than ever, you're starting to see people uh, definitely publicly start to push back against sort of some of these mainstream narratives. And at least, you know, that it, for a while there, they weren't even thinking twice about it. And now it's at least seeming like there are people that are like saying, OK, there has to be something else because for one, it's not working. You know, let's let's start yeah. there. It's not working. But I think just seeing be it my story seeing the stories of these other uh, of other people are letting people know that look there is another option there are other ways to think um um that will be better for the, your own culture and yourself uh, as well so in my experience yes I, I, and, and that, that's part of the reason again going back to what we're talking white peeled man I'm, I'm all i'm all about optimism i'm seeing it i'm I, we're all seeing it last question i ask this of everybody you know, called Dad Saves America, and um, I think you're a hero for young people that want to to come from where you're coming from, and the story you've told to where you are now, building an empire, mm -hmm. building literally a universe. You're building a universe. What do you see as your role in the American story? Well, if I can just limit it to one word, create. I think that coming up with original ideas is why I am here and watching that manifest in whatever way that may be, whether it be offering my uh, position on something, whether it be making music, whether it be making comic books. I believe that God put me on this earth to create and the fact that I've been rewarded in, in, in ways that I blessed in ways that I just would have never imagined. And every time it was when I was creating, every single time I benefited the most when I said, hey, let's make something for the people to see, make something for the people to watch, for the people to read, for the people to view, whatever it is. So for me, I think that's what it's about. It's about creating. And when I'm off of this earth, I would think that a lot of people are going to take away from it that he was an absolute workhorse that was always coming up with new ideas. Um, and he was trying to do his best to be a part of whatever solution to the world that he, uh, that, that he thought of. 
and uh, I, I worked I worked extremely hard. So my again limiting it to one word, I would say to create. That's what I'm here for. Eric, thank you for being on Dad Saves America. I appreciate you so much. It's been bro. a great conversation. This has been fun. This has been fun. Hopefully we can do it again soon. Next time we can get into uh, heavy metal music, which Ooh. you'll have to school me on. I'll this. do that. I'm game. I'm 100% game for that. Let's do it. Let's, Let's do, do it. it.